Hello everyone, and welcome to a very special Final Fantasy VII Rebirth stream. I should tell you right out of the gate that this is a spoiler podcast discussion. It means that we are going through all the spoilers, in-game content, the ending. We are breaking all of that down live today. We're going to be talking about things that if you have not finished, you will want to go finish first because we're spoiling everything from OG, compilation. So with that out of the way, there is no one else in the whole world that I really want to do this with first then Schrodinger's Baby Seal. Now for those of you guys who don't know me and Baby Seal actually became friends over arguing about this game. <laughs> <laughs> it started with us basically discussing remake together and then you know we had a lot of disagreement but after we you know talked about it and we discussed other things we realized that we actually had way more in common except for our opinions about this one thing and even then that was still a thing that we had in common ultimately yeah and now you know we are great friends he is one of the you know best people that i have in my life period and yeah there's just no one else this is kind of a the full circle homecoming of our relationship basically um no other way to really put it yeah so yeah, yeah so this is this is this was really important so um whenever we had the opportunity to do this i i just immediately jumped at it but for those who somehow if you're, you're in the ff7 community and you still don't know who schrodinger's baby seal is uh can you tell them about what you do clark and um where they can check you out well uh yeah i um first of all uh thank you for having me and um you know this is this is a big deal too and uh the same i wasn't going to do this with anybody else first and uh i, I appreciate that um you can find me on on Twitch. I will be uh, streaming all of uh, all of Rebirth, start to finish. Now that most people have sort of beaten the game and doing it like a kind of a granular lore stuff, I have um, Twitter, but uh, YouTube is my primary platform. I do a podcast called Seal Team Seven, which is generally Square focused and and Final Fantasy focused, and started sort of as a result of a Final Fantasy Seven remake and all the. Uh, lore and conversation that came around there. I have a, a mythology and religious background um, and philosophy. So uh, you, I kind of look at things from that kind of very granular slant. Also, big shout out to Shinra Archaeology Department, which I'm a part of, that does a lot of things that help preserve the the lore of this 25, 26-year-old, um, you know, intellectual property. And uh, I'm sure you'll put all the links and stuff in the video description for the VOD and, and find us on Twitter, etc. But yeah, I I uh I I'm essentially a Final Fantasy VII content creator that also does other stuff, you know. That's awesome. So, I mean that I guess yeah. that's how I how I started too. You know, I was really yeah. big focus on um Final Fantasy and then his remake came along, really big focus on seven and then now I'm kind of seeing myself branching out into other things with like Stellar Blade and Persona and all those sort of sorts of games too. And yeah, it's yeah. just really great though. I feel like uh, FF7 is really just something that has brought us all together in such a profound way. And it's just interesting because, you know, Final Fantasy VII within itself, <laughs> you know, is like, you know, there's so many different opinions on just this one game and so many different right um in a way such that it can almost be like you know ff7 fandom is almost like an umbrella term for the different aspects of final fantasy 7 that people are fans of right. and i think i think that after this ending in particular <laughs> and after this game we may have even more you know subdivisions of of final fantasy fans <laughs> Yeah, who are absolutely. you know into into their own particular aspects of uh what this game introduced uh yeah. so i want to start out by asking what are the strongest parts of rebirth for you in terms of game design narrative and overall and what was the worst okay uh good question to start i, yeah. I think um you know i did a, a i posted a spoiler free review um you know uh leading up to the release because i have i've had this i've had this game for a couple months i've been sitting on this game for uh you know a little longer than uh the average bear and so i've i've had a lot of feelings and thoughts about it and 
Uh, I can tell you that in terms of the, the gameplay, there is uh, no element that isn't iteratively, iteratively improved upon, uh, in my opinion. There's no element of rebirth gameplay and design wise that isn't superior to remake. Uh, the combat uh, still fantastic, and uh, I think it, it addresses some of the core issues uh with combat it does which in a way that i thought was kind of implausible i sort of thought that combat would um in addressing things like aerial combat and addressing things like you know a preponderance of party members lose some of its weight i thought that it would feel like kind of uh i hate to I hate to trigger the KH fandom with this, but the but floaty. I was worried that this would feel like a floatier combat, but I think it really, really somehow maintains that core like visceral connection with each act action that you take in combat with the ability to like get in the air. And um and I felt like confident that they could do that thanks to the DLC, thanks to the Yuffie. Uh, but I was nervous that they would would really limit that ability to certain characters. But uh, right off the bat, you know, your main character, Cloud, has these new, you know, aerial combat techniques that make it feel really, uh, just really like, uh, kind of like what I always dreamed of, you know, when I, back in the day when I saw Advent Children and still, mm. you know, uh, I was like, man, I wish we had a Cloud game that that looked like this and played like kingdom hearts um one and two maybe uh and uh not three uh i love three you know, <laughs> for different reasons different reasons mm. um so i um i really think that that was really well done i think that uh you know the the open world design um uh, it, it to be totally honest, it took me a little bit of time to fall in love with that. Um, the way they kind of designed uh, the the flow of World Intel is that the first big open area feels like the most overwhelmingly large one, and then they get more manageable as you progress. Even mm. even even when you get to like the middle of the game, there's like these. Um, you, you kind of have your run of an entire continent. It, the way that they they engineered uh, your the the stuff that you get to do was really, I think, um, it was progressive. So it made you feel like you had more and more mastery and control over all the game systems by the time you got there so that it didn't feel overwhelming when you got to the last big open areas. And, um, you know, it still does the big open area game stuff where there's a bunch of uh, you know, like a big quest dump at the end. And, you, you know, I I actually prefer that. I, I want that. Mm. I want I want to be able to do a bunch of stuff before I, you know, go head into the ending. And I, I think the post game content in this is super, super clear. Uh, really mm. good. Um, characterization wise, I think characters and performances were all good. I I don't I can't really think of of one that was like, that's really bad. Uh, I even sort of found myself like really getting um, like finding myself like less concerned about Zach, you know, and, mm -hmm. and Caleb, um, his performance during that stuff. Uh, but to to story, um, I really liked what they did with the story. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, I have some gripes, but. Uh, overall, I thought the story was really, really, uh, it was centered around character. And, uh, then when it gets into the, like the moving the plot forward and paying off the risks, I actually, I was pretty satisfied with the ways that it deviated, uh, overall. Mm -hmm. Um, I really liked, I think my favorite chapter is easily chapter nine. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and I think that that was one of the chapters that was sort of most heavily divergent from the OG. Um, and so I really liked chapter nine. I liked the, I liked the final chapter very much from a, and this is probably the most surprising one from a story perspective. Mm -hmm. I did think that it had some issues um, with some of its execution. 
uh, like music and stuff like that. Um, and I think that there was some pacing issues in, in some of the chapters. Uh, and I would say that the worst things overall for me, I think the worst things were actually some of like the more faithfully recreated things. Mm. I think they, um, they just kind of missed the mark on, I, I felt that like, for instance, the dine scene and the mm. Sato scene were really, um, they were really well performed. Like John Eric Bentley brushed it. And mm. I thought like, I still got really emotional to, to see him in that role, see him open up emotionally. Like his, oh, yeah. his performance was mm. really powerful and tear felt. And I loved the, um, you know, the little bro moment with, with cloud afterwards, but the actual composition of the scene, um, I, and the, and the, and the kind of sanitization of like the, the, the topic of depression and suicide, I, I felt like it undermined one of the, the themes of the game. And I think that mental well health and illness is a theme is one of the core themes of the game. And I think that you do run the risk when you treat that in an over sanit overly sanitary manner of like not really a addressing its tragedy. Yeah. You know, and so I, I was affected by that. I think that um, they also had an opportunity to like uh, remove some plausibility problems with um, with with Red 13 and Seto and, and Bugenhagen. Um, I there's always I've always like had this little issue where it really didn't make sense to not tell or or the specific lie that they told Red 13 was that was that his dad died a coward. And I thought we would get an explanation why that was a superior way. Like, uh, and the explanation we got is pretty much the same. And it's that like, well, uh, if we would have told you, you would have gone looking for him down here. Well, you could have just not told him he was here, you know, or told him <laughs> that we buried the body somewhere else. Like there is a way to protect him and still not like traumatize and gaslight a child for 50 years. It just... <laughs> it, it was weird. Also, also just in general, I felt like the, kind of like an example of the way that that Rebirth really like both narratively let us let me down and shined was in that chapter, because one of the things that I leading up to chapter chapter 10 in particular, the Cosmo Canyon in particular was like, this is going to be the lore dump. This is where we're going to we're going to Bugenhagen is going to explain how the entire system works to us. Mm. And instead, Bugenhagen told us nothing new was kind of a dick. <laughs> and then and then and then instead, though, instead, we do get a really interesting lore dump. And it's from Guy Natak, who mm. I think that that whole scene that was like that had so much soul and richness and interesting vibes like the dark vibes of like the the Guy village and stuff like that was really it was like interesting compelling and um it had that kind of eerie tone and darkness that i was surprised that they were capable of and i was even more surprised that they were capable of that when i got to the next chapter chapter 11 which in my opinion, is the greatest sort of tonal <laughs> failure of the game. And that's that the Nibelheim, the Nebel mansion was um, was a big letdown for me. Uh, there were good things in that chapter. There's important lore in that chapter, too, that I think sort of tells us what the game, what part three is really about. Um, but, uh, you know, and Vincent, I think Vincent's they, they nailed Vincent. That boss fight was fine. Uh, and I don't, I don't like dislike Kate Sith. I don't think his gameplay was bad in any way. I just think that the, like, they could have still had us controlling Kate Sith in the, in the manner, but made it like appropriately creepy and have the appropriate tone. Uh, also not letting us, exp like, not letting us explore upstairs, like, uh, the safe code being just like this thing written on a wall like that hurt my heart like mm -hmm. i felt really 
really some kind of way about that. Um, mm. But then I think uh, the game gets good again in 12. I really thought that date was so good. Like, no, I and every version of that date is absolutely like a must watch. Mm. Um, the, um, you know, and then I know that chapter 13 is probably going to be something that we have contentions on. <laughs> I personally agree with the criticism that the first half is draining and it's a little overly mm. long. Uh, the gameplay mechanics are rough. Um, however, I do think that the last order of that chapter uh, is peak. I loved mm. it. It hits all the things that I really wanted to mm. out of it. Um, and I think the best thing, like best singular thing about Rebirth is uh, building up Cloud's uh, tenuous mental health. I think... I think mm. uh, I think Dark punished Cloud, or you know Sephir Sephiroth Cloud is the coolest part of this game by like a mile. Mm. So, yeah, like when he's dodging those bullets and he's just like, oh my yeah. god, that scene was incredible. I love so that scene. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I that, that was kind of a long answer, but um, you know, it was a long question. So, but yeah. I, I want to hear just like your I you know your. Okay. Exact question. Mm. So, wow. Best parts of the game for me by far was just the general overall game design, which I found incredibly addictive. Um, every time I'd put the game down, I would find myself wanting to pick it back up. Uh, you know, I'd binging the game pre-release to get my review out. And then as soon as I finished binging it, I was immediately like, I want to play again. <laughs> I immediately wanted to play again. I think that Square with modern Final Fantasy titles has been trying to find the footing that they had with their Golden Age titles. And they've played around with a lot of things and they've tried to find, you know, what is kind of the identity of Final Fantasy going forward in the modern era. And so they've done a lot of different things trying to find the thing that kind of catches on. And that people will really latch on to. And they've experimented with a lot of different systems trying to do that. And this dates back to like Final Fantasy XII with them trying like what they call the active dimension battle system where, you know, you had yeah. the gambits and things didn't operate in rigid turns. They had Final Fantasy XIII's command synergy battle system, which allows you to like kind of issue the commands as like a group chain and then all your party members would chain those attacks together and you'd stagger. You know, they had Final Fantasy 15, which was the jump to um, a more pure action system. And then 16, um, which was in many ways, uh, literally a Devil May Cry like. And yeah. they've tried all these different things, but I really think, especially in Rebirth, they've nailed the system that I feel is, or what I would personally describe as, like the most Final Fantasy feeling system that they've come up with in like the modern era. I feel like it incorporates all the elements of a Final Fantasy game that I'd want to see, like the summons being able and how you can command the summons, turning that into very good action game mechanics, yeah. such that it doesn't feel like I'm sacrificing some element of what the older Final Fantasy games had with this new game. It feels like everything is there and everything is there in such a large quantity and quality that it's almost overwhelming. This game has more content in it than any single player Final Fantasy game has ever had ever. And I don't think it's even close. I can't think of another game in the FF series other than like 14 in its current state <laughs> that actually comes close to having as much content as Rebirth. It is absolutely nuts. To, um, to give you a little bit of context on that. Yeah. For people that uh, maybe didn't have access to guides, yeah, the only people with platinums could really not do it without putting two hundred hours in. That's two hundred accurate hours, like not like the PlayStation count, but the Rebirth count. Like that is, that's pretty. I I, I mean, like I think completionists for thirteen, like really aren't even in that ballpark. You know, I think that's like what 130 tops for completionism uh, right. for 13. Yeah. 
So I, I think you're objectively correct. All right. And not only that, but just the quality of the actual content. I would say that most of the game is more oftentimes fun than not doing most of the game's content. Um, now, obviously, I haven't even come close to platinum yet. So maybe that'll change. But everything I've done in the game, I would describe myself having a crap ton of fun more often than not. Uh, it's yeah. just it, it's enjoyable pretty much all the way through, minus some sections uh, that I did not care for. <laughs> but for the most part, considering the amount of content in this game, it's staggering just how much is actually pretty good uh, and not just pretty good. Some of it is just outright like, you know, the best the series has ever had point blank there are so many fights queen's blood you know fort condor like stuff in in there that i'm playing through and i'm just like this is so much fun yeah this is yeah, the most engaged. yeah exactly yeah. like this is the most engaged i've been with final fantasy in a long time and i think what i find to be the best about this is just variety because i feel like the game is always having me do something new, something different and something interesting. Sometimes that's through mini games. Sometimes it's through the way you're getting through dungeons and you have, you know, your party split up and the party is going through the dungeon in different ways, different combat and different mechanics. And I'd say that if there's a problem that I've had with contemporary FF games, it has kind of been that you do a lot of the same thing for the entire game for the most part. Um, so I think like a common criticism that you might make of like, say like Final Fantasy 13 or like Final Fantasy 16 would be that there is not like a game outside of combat. Combat is the game. And without that, there's nothing else to it. And I kind of feel personally that an RPG should be like a collection of systems and not just entirely reliant on just its combat to create a whole game especially because rpgs are long they are very long games and so you kind of want to introduce variety into them so that it doesn't make mm. you feel like you are doing the same monotonous action for dozens of dozens of hours on end and rebirth yeah. i feel like gets that a lot more so than pretty much any of the modern ff titles um, that you should just constantly be doing something new and something fresh. And that's what sustains the experience for, you know, a hundred plus hours is knowing that uh, whatever is going to be around the corner is different from the thing that you were just doing five minutes ago. If I was to answer like kind of the worst thing about my experience, I think that the pacing um, in some of the sections, late game sections, was a little mm -hmm. bit grating to me as we kind of discussed like with chapter 13. I do think that some of the narrative bits of chapter 13 were good, um, but um, especially the parts with Aerith and Ifalna and that whole heartbreaking scene where, you know, you have like this little girl out in the streets, basically, you know, pleading for someone to help her dying mother. And all of these people are just like, we can't help you, kid. Don't know what to say. Completely disregarding her. That part was uh really heartbreaking i just wish that uh maybe we could have got to that scene a little bit faster than like you know five hours of dungeon crawling and fighting some of the same enemies over and over and over um yeah but... <laughs> i think i think they really could have just broken that into two chapters i think they could have too and i feel like it would have flowed a lot better other than that there there is some stuff with like some contentions with scenes uh like you brought up with like dying for example which um yeah I, I don't agree with some of the choices that they made surrounding that and it was pretty much for all the same reasons that you touched upon and i think yeah. those those are like really really my low points and then i do have a couple of things to critique about the ending too sure but we yeah. we, would, we would get in <laughs> we'll be getting into that uh in a bit here but those those were probably my main low points with it but for the most part um i would say the vast majority of the game was an absolute win for me huge win i i'm in the same boat i'm in the same boat and i i you know strangely i, I mean like this is probably the best game i've this is probably my favorite game of the decade so far mm. um you know which is a 
I mean, I've, there's been some games I've really enjoyed this decade. Um, but I probably have more critiques of this game than I do any of the other five on like my top list. And mm -hmm. that's that's actually kind of normal for me. I have a tendency to be really, really critical of the things that I like, mm. you know, um, you know, because I look at them more deeply, etc. But um, and so I, I do wonder, like, I, I think that there's a lot of stuff that I, I think that if you and I were to, like, count our critiques of Rebirth, we'd mm. probably have the same count, you know, probably, and, probably um, so. Yeah. Yeah, uh, they're just a little. They have a little bit different focus. Yeah, no, I, I would. A I little, would completely. I like would, <laughs> most of them is the same. Yeah, most of yeah. them. Like, yeah. Yeah, I, I would. I would completely agree. So. Yeah. Um, I already see some questions in chat. Chat. We will uh, toward the end of the stream. We we take all the questions. So, um, just to let you guys know. That being said, let's get into it. With. Let's do it the big elephant in the room. It seems as though the big reveal with Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is that this is indeed a multiverse. How do you feel about the confirmation of this element in Final Fantasy VII's lore? I think there's a couple of things that really indicate uh, like an uncomfortable truth about anthology storytelling. Mm. And that's that uh, often the bones or structure of a plot are in place and the details will get rearranged based on fan response. Mm. Um, and so I, I do think that the way that quote unquote multiverse is implemented here is a way that tries to be a confirmation of everybody's headcanon. Um, so essentially what it does is it, is it, it is predicated on the live stream, right? So people that were really like, it's all happening in the live stream. Well, sure, it is. But it's also multiple worlds inside the live stream. And the live stream is also the, the, the layer of existence that everything is really happening in anyways, right? So it's sort of this... It's a uh, what they've done is they've sort of increased the definition of the live stream to be a Deus Ex, right? So that it can kind of fill all the gaps in the story and um, be as powerful as possible to eliminate consistency issues, which it still kind of doesn't necessarily do. I think they did the absolute best they could have done with it always with this particular crew if you look at hamaguchi in like a nomura created world with a nojima backed lore authorship multiverse is never really a very consistent mechanic it's always something that the themes and feelings and uh or sort of you know, like emotional narratives will trump in terms of consistency. And that's, you know, both a cultural thing and it's just sort of the way that these people in particular tell stories. You are not going to get like levels of plot consistency uh, that, you know, maybe we have come to uh, appreciate or grow accustomed to from like Christopher Nolan films. Like that's never going to be a thing that you're going to get here. So what I think they did is they where I think that this was successful was um, they sort of explained that the cause is within the remake project. They sort of explained that the reason that there are these many worlds that diverge and branch, uh, so to speak, is because destiny was broken at the end of 17 or at the end of, of you know, of remake, essentially. Meaning that we are not like now all of a sudden supposed to accept that there's this, you know, the universe of Final Fantasy VII has always been multiversal. No, the events of Remake in particular created this diversion. 
divergent. So I think that's more honest and fair to the player and to the audience to do that. Um, I also think what they did is they really understated um, kind of the 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 stakes imperative, right? So the problem with a lot of multiverse stories is that there's, you know, uh, there's now copies of all these characters. So if you lose one, you can just get, you know, you can get Ultron 2 or, you know, <laughs> this is Captain America 2, but played by, you know, I don't know, the less popular Hemsworth, like whatever, you know, like, um, you know, it, it kind of eliminates the issue with stakes. Mm. We're not really getting an indication that there's multiple copies of characters here. There technically could be, but it seems to be more that like there's a singular soul that can live, you know, multiple copy, you know, multiple variances of experiences within like this kind of ethereal dream state. And it does seem like, you know, there is a meaningful and necessary distinction between the quote unquote, like top layer and the worlds within worlds, right? Meaning that like, and, and I think this was one of the strengths of like the Gi tribe lore is we know that there are beings that are separate from the life stream. Like they are separate from the world system. And we know that like Chadley is really concerned about whether or not he could ever join the live stream. That's that might be in a quest you didn't do. That's in the Gilgamesh quest. But um, he has this musing about like, can I go? Will I ever get to go to the live stream? And, you know, the implication is no, because he's separate from it. So what that sort of indicates is, you know, these are these things that are separate from the live stream. And they do make a real clear point to make sure that none of those beings appear in any of the interlude scenes. Mm. Um, I'll also say that, um, you know, I've watched I've watched the ending essentially every day <laughs> since for the last two months. Mm. And I've watched it in several languages and um, particularly the first part of chapter 14, which is the interlude. And you did a breakdown of this. And I think that that's a fair takeaway is that uh, each of each of Zach's choices creates like a new world somehow. I think that's a fair takeaway. I, there are I, there are consistency problems with it that make it not necessarily 100% true. But mm. again, the problem with particularly Square Enix and telling stories like this is they're not like the most consistent storytellers and they sometimes leave mistakes in on accident. Um, and so it's so when you see like, for instance, after Zach makes the quote unquote Biggs choice, like he makes the choice, goes down the tunnel and we see Aerith's rainbow coming through on that same tunnel going the other way, leading essentially like that seemed to be like Aerith's consciousness going back to her body or the church. And then they have the, the cloud date scene with the, you know, the, um, I don't know if it's a Shibu and you Shiba Inu or a Shih Tzu. Chat it's a, it's GPT a, it's says a, it's a Shih Tzu. Yeah, that's what Chat GPT said. I'm not like a yeah. dog expert, but yeah. I don't know either. I also like it's a fictional universe, but like yeah. the the after that scene where big where Zach makes the Bigs choice, mm. the next frame is Zach on his motorcycle in the Shinra HQ, and it's dark, but there's a terrier there. And you're like, oh, well, is that intentional or did they make a mistake? And ironically, it is the same Terrier that we see in Junon mm. in the quote unquote prime timeline. And my personal opinion as to why the Terrier is there is that it's a mistake, um, mm. you know, in both instances. Like that's a very but you don't know because they they it's they don't treat it with the same kind of like engineering mind that like a lot of other multiverse stories are are created in where it's like this exercise and making as complex of a puzzle fit together as possible 
You know, like that's not the way that they're valuing this. Mm -hmm. I personally, after watching it several times, and of, uh, am of the opinion that the interlude, which specifically is the Zack segment, is he is in a world, Zack is in a world that has accepted its fate. And that world is in the process of changing because that world is comprised of the memories and decisions of its occupants. So I think that that for instance the pug chip bag doesn't represent Zach's choice to help Biggs. I think it just represents Biggs. Mm. You know, and I think that the Shih Tzu doesn't represent, you know, um Zach's choice to not go to cloud because Zach didn't really make a choice associated with that dog. Zach made a choice going in the opposite direction. But in that date scene, we see that Shih Tzu really fun to say. Um, <laughs> we see that Shih Tzu in the in the date scene. Um, and I think that's representative of of cloud in that moment like the that version of cloud right uh because cloud is in a real bizarre state it could even you know uh have something to do with with Aerith in particular um so i i think that the interlude c is is really not meant to be uh a literally engineered unfolding or multiversal tale i think it's meant to be uh something a little bit more esoteric something mm -hmm. a little bit more alan wakeish and um you know that's confusing and irritating you know to to watch for people that really just want to understand um and it's really like it's a very valid need to understand things like it's it's not a it's it's not fair i think to say like hey you shouldn't be unsatisfied that you didn't get all the answers. That's fair. Like some people really want that and that's a fair need. Mm -hmm. I personally resonated with the uh, the dialogue it was going to create, the mystery, the exploration of it. Um mm -hmm. is it a multiverse? Technically, like in this bizarre way, it's technically. Does it still run the risk of like creating a scenario where like you know, all the characters get their golden identity, golden ending. Sure. Do I think that's likely? No. And part of the reason I don't think that's unlikely or that I think that's unlikely. And this is, again, maybe not a credit to the story, but like. Is that a lot of this seems to be predicated on the fandom hunger, hunger games, like whatever fans probably like are vocal about wanting the most is going to be what happens. Because I, 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 I think that's sort of really indicated in this game, you know, and well, like and that that has this like risk of it being, well, you know, uh, this isn't the creative vision of the devs. This is fan service. That's a fair critique. But I think meeting in the middle, there is a creative vision and some of the details and mechanics are, you know, going to be re reworked in a way that implements feedback you know that's kind of what i think um mm -hmm. you know uh as far as the second half of the chapter i know i'm being long-winded but i've no, got good. a lot to say and i'm gonna say yeah, please, everything yes. that yeah this is the way to say it mm. uh the second half of the chapter um i i i i i've gone back and forth on this but i'm feeling extremely extremely confident now that we're not seeing cloud in two worlds. We're not seeing cloud in a world that is, you know, uh, where he saved Aerith and one world where he didn't. I think there's a lot of stuff that sets this up too. And I am releasing a video on this with a lot of specific details mm -hmm. uh, that back this up. So this is not i haven't pulled this out of my ass just to be real clear <laughs> and this isn't copium this isn't even really like i i i was okay either way with how mm. they did this 
Um, I've been actually waiting for Max Dude to finish the game so that I have permission to talk about it. Um, not that he gives me permission, but anyways. So um, <laughs> the the way that I think that scene is best interpreted, most mm. accurately interpreted, is that Aerith sees that Sephiroth's endgame is to break Cloud. The Sephiroth's last line before they leave the, you know, the the big singularity, the reunion of worlds talk where he's talking about like this is the true nature of our reality. The last thing he says to Cloud is well, I guess you're going to need a little push because he ref because Cloud actively refused. He says, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be in your reunion. I don't want any part of it. And so Sephiroth then says, you just need a little push. You have my blessing. Then at this point, we're in the Forgotten Capital and the party is led the White Whispers, which I believe are Aerith. Aerith has used Holy to decorrupt the Whispers, right? So the reason that they maintain the same hooded figure shape that that Sephiroth gave them, but are now white, is because Aerith's magic has purified them, which mm. I think is a metaphor for the entire game. The entire Final Fantasy VII game is that is that a reunion clone is purified and finds himself. Mm. Right. So it's still part of who he is, just like the whispers. It's still part of what they are is Sephiroth's corruption, but they've become white because they purified it. Those whispers, the white whispers, try to stop the party from entering the forgotten, forgotten capital. And the reason that is, is because Sephiroth wants Cloud there. Sephiroth needs Cloud to enter that, enter the, enter the Forgotten Capital and get the push. Hmm. Right? So we get up to the wall of, of whispers and suddenly Black Whispers open the door for Cloud. That's Sephiroth's blessing. And mm -hmm. Cloud alone. So Cloud go alone goes in there. And while in there, we, you know, the, the scene happens. As soon as Sephiroth is descending, life stream emanates from the Buster Sword. Mm -hmm. And and Cloud is gets a vision of him successfully saving Aerith. Every time that that is visually represented, every time there is a visual representation of Cloud succeeding in that moment, the the language goes pure green, pure life stream. Um, so not just that scene, but later on when uh, Sephiroth is giving his little speech, his little ha 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 speech, um, all of a sudden we see life stream emanating from Aerith. Her hand reaches out, touches Cloud's face, and so we see this really bittersweet reality where Aerith recognizes that if Cloud in this moment accepts quote unquote his failure, he will be lost to Sephiroth. He will, the same thing that happened to Roche will happen to him. And in the Roche sequence, by the way, which is, I. I love Roche's character. I really, I like what they did with him. I was a little bummed at how, how he just showed up with a robe after he was like on the ground. I felt like really kind of corny. But after that scene, Tifa and Aerith come up to Cloud and Aerith says, that's not going to happen to you. And, mm -hmm. she, and Tifa agrees with him. Or Tifa agrees with Aerith. Yeah, we're not going to let that happen. Mm -hmm. So... To me, it seems really clear that the purpose of Aerith counter gaslighting Cloud is because in that moment, it prevents Sephiroth from doing the push. 
And so I think at the end of the game, the Aerith that is talking to Cloud is the same life stream ghost Aerith that we see in Remake during the resolution scene, the don't fall in love oh. with me scene. That Aerith, and I, I'm not saying that there's multiple Aeriths. I'm saying this is right. Aerith from the live stream in the future who has, you know, while playing chess with Sephiroth in the live stream, made this chess move. I'm going to free Cloud of his despair. Because one of the things that Sephiroth's really consistent with in this game and in the compilation, uh, very much so in Advent Children and in uh, On the Way to a Smile, is that that the the mechanism by which Sephiroth corrupts the life stream is despair. Like that's that's mechanically how geostigma forms. Geostigma like feeds on your despair. So this is one of the many links to Advent Children that that I think comes up is that Sephiroth is weaponizing despair and he will not shut up about it. The reason that Roche kind of finally falls to the degradation is because he's lost hope. Mm -hmm. Same with Broden. So Aerith, I think, has hatched a plan to prevent Cloud from becoming a robed clone. And I think she is working in tandem with Tifa on this. And part of the reason I think that is in Gongaga, when um, when there's the almost kiss that Kate Sith and Yuffie interrupt accidentally, there's this very, very specific and deliberate scene where Tifa comes out and he she and Aerith block eyes. Aerith says something, but we don't hear it. They intentionally muted it. Um, so I think there's this real understanding that that they are tagging in. They're helping Cloud, right? And the, the very last thing, too, that Aerith says is this is more important than that. This is about the world and it's about you because mm -hmm. those things are interlinked. Right. When she hands him the white materia, she's saying this is about more than me. It's about the world and it's about you because you being cloud cloud is very important to the you know salvation of the world in this mm. in this case. So I think all of the mysteries of 14 thematically are really designed to feed. What the core narrative mystery of Final Fantasy seven is, and that's cloud's mind the live stream sequence you know mm. and um i know you've had subtext on as a guest before and we're all friends uh he he covers that really well uh, one of the most consistent dev statements is that the crux of final fantasy 7 is the live stream sequence which is in cloud's mind also i do not think that the rift in the sky at the end that cloud sees is an indication that he's seeing another world I think mm. that rift very specifically is defined as meaning this world is marked for death because I think that world is marked for death. I right. think the world of Final Fantasy VII is currently marked for death. It also looks identical and I showed you pictures of this and it's floating on Twitter and it's in my video, but it mm. looks identical to the string of of um, of of like kind of cosmic yellow in Cloud's mind sequence. So the last thing that we see is Cloud looking up at the sky, seeing that rift that looks exactly like the one that's in the Cloud's mind live stream sequence. Mm. And I think that's because that's what all of these narrative mysteries are meant to do is allow more characterization in what is the crux of Final Fantasy VII. And that is Cloud's mind, Cloud sanity. Um, and it also, to me, actually added a level, a layer of bittersweetness to Aerith's death. It's like, not only are we getting to see that scene in this iconic fashion, but we're also watching like the sadness of his delusion over it, which I don't know why that broke me more, but it was mm. really like kind of heart wrenching. Um, 
if you have a criticism that the that the you know the the mysteries and all that stuff robbed the the emotion from the scene because you're too busy being con- confused that's incredibly valid mm. and not lowering the body being in there uh you know it, because it's probably been moved to final to to part 3 when you know mm. during the the true live stream sequence you know that stuff all uh that made this scene kind of disappointing there's no way around it and uh a lot of a lot of the issues with remakes ending were like you lost the feeling of connection to it emotionally because it made a choice to serve the future of the series instead of the moment you know and mm. i i do see that i also think that the ending chapter um like you enter the for- forgotten capital and uh it's like they play like the most iconic music for me in that scene was like the forgotten capital theme mm. which is played all throughout the game but mm. never in the forgotten capital and <laughs> that robbed that robbed the moment a little bit because there's something super otherworldly and alien and forebode foreboding about that mm. that music in the OG but instead it's like advent children music mixed with some other music and i you know uh i think that's a super fair critique um but you know that's kind of where i'm at with what's happening and again there's somehow more to it than that but i you know very much over time right so uh, <laughs> i know we love hearing you talk um yeah i guess my walk away from the ending was very much that cloud was potentially seeing two worlds um kind of overlapping i feel yeah. like um that interpretation is still kind of probably easy to glean from the ending and probably the way that i feel like a lot of people will interpret it or at least uh, that's the way a lot of people have interpreted online there's also some people in chat that are that i've noticed <laughs> that are still uh refuting that this is multiverse so i also find that really interesting to see how people will um reconcile all the plot differences and such without did, this I being just, a multiverse because that's that's going to be see really how it's not a multiverse. yeah I, I i don't see how it could be either in some way this is a multiverse right like yeah it, 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 sure, like, I... if you wanted to find it any other way that's fine but like i don't yeah. see how it's not multiple universes with overlapping characters in the way that we typically define multiverse so um, I am curious to see people in chat making their cases. Gene, hello. Gene says, I don't think it is still. So Gene doesn't think that it's multiverse either. Um, I'd love to see some people in chat, if they could, while I elaborate on this, explaining. Just because I'm kind of confused on where that position comes from, especially after this game. I under- there was very much, you know, some plausible deniability, I think, after finishing Remake on whether this was multiverse or not. But I feel like after finishing this game, and finishing chapter 14 and it kind of becomes kind of becomes apparent uh gene says it's a dream Aerith didn't call it another world um right. I, and that's fair like that's right. that's absolutely fair however other people call it you know worlds like including like the the, the game descriptions like so if you go through the chapter recaps like it does just basically say like uh you know that zach Zack enters through, um, uh, he goes through a space between worlds. Right. Also, like, it straight up says that Gilgamesh is from another world. Yeah. Which was kind of perfect to actually fit him in since he travels yeah. to different worlds. Yeah. And they're like, oh, yeah, let's fit Gilgamesh. And that, that was actually kind of a stroke of genius. But I opinion. also yeah. do think, yeah. I also do think he's right about that world being Aerith's dream like it is it is mostly shaped I think by her will like nobody that was saved or is a like a a key character in that world isn't somebody that Aerith doesn't have a specific connection to even Kyrie and this is a this is a deep lore thing but Kyrie knew Aerith and we know that from the kids are all right there's a whole segment like that that was her primary connection to the lore of Final Fantasy VII was Aerith. So all of the characters that are a focus in the interlude are characters specific to Aerith's relationship. 
Aerith knew Biggs instead of the other Avalanche members because of the orphanage and because in, um, you know, uh, the the recent Traces of Two Paths, we find out that they had a childhood friendship, right? Mm. So, so there is, you can say that it's a dream and also still be right. This is what I was talking about, that this game really does try and make as many interpretations true as possible and in some ways that's really interesting and in some ways it's unsatisfying right yeah i think that it is a multiverse of sorts uh, i think it kind of becomes undeniable to me after this and that's kind of like leads me into our next topic because i wanted to talk about zach here and the utilization of zach now, Zack in, in the final fight, I feel like that was kind of like where it sealed the deal for me that there is like a real Zack out there um, who comes into play. Because if this is like some sort of like thing happening in the live stream, then I feel like you wouldn't get like this actual Zack that comes out of a portal and help fights with you at Sephiroth, right? Um, but then I guess the counter argument would be that after Aerith's death, you still got an Aerith who also walk through a portal and was able to fight alongside you so there's a lot of contention there and but i think i think that there is still a definite difference between how zach showed up especially how things ended with zach and zach going back to his own world and then kind of lamenting if worlds can come back together then he can see cloud and the others again and obviously i think that it's going to be his character arc in the next game where he's seeking to reunite the worlds again um, so that he can join alongside Cloud and Aerith and everyone else in the other timeline. What are your thoughts on the utilization of Zack and his character in Final Fantasy VII Rebirth? Uh, it feels, uh, you know, I'll rate it a 7 out of 10 because it, like, um, it feels like they had a bigger plan for it and then peeled mm. it back a little bit. And so it, I, I'm going to deduct it three points for that. Uh, here's what I'll say about him showing up in a fight uh, is that where he shows up in that fight is super I think important um, you actually fight Sephiroth together at the edge of creation the edge of creation um, is is one of the like least concrete places in terms of like defining its reality that you can imagine it could be in cloud's mind um and then we see like that same surface that they're but just then covered with water during the Aerith fight so i i can't say that like the fight with zach or Aerith is something that's beyond the ethereal or beyond mental i don't think it's i don't think that you can say that that's concrete like the fact that you fight with zach or Aerith. i don't think mm. that that's like an indication that he's actually alive i do think though that the next scene that we see him in right so he's in this he's in this the church that has ripped open and you're fighting sephiroth Reborn, you're fighting reverse Sephiroth or Bizarro Sephiroth in the church. In and like we keep seeing that like flower, uh, you know, the flower animation from kind of Aerith's white light when you're doing that fight, mm -hmm. showing up in the middle. And if you go in the middle, you you know, um, uh, get blessings. Uh, that, by the way, is my favorite single scene, like uh, set piece for a fight uh, in in the whole game. It's beautiful to me, like mm -hmm. like just this idea of like this float, the church floating, but ripped open mm -hmm. after that fight. Um, you see Zach going like, this is it. Bye. You know, <laughs> smell you later type thing. <laughs> and then and then a, a, a white portal opens up and he falls into it. And he's surrounded by white whispers. And then the next scene we see him in, he is in an intact church talking about reuniting worlds. That Zach 
is, for all intents and purposes, functionally alive. He, I would, I would argue, he is more alive than Oron. In <laughs> you know, in in Ortidas, um, mm-hmm. like that dude's alive, and we're not, we're not done seeing him. Um, to what extent? Again. I think uh, depends on the fandom hunger, hunger games, like however, however much people resonate mm. with that or not uh, depends on like kind of. And so I, I do think that he is like legitimately now. Uh, Aerith has made sure that he's escaped death in some way, you know, and uh, they've got a bunch of different ways that they can uh, do that. They can try and fit him into the story in a way that somehow does not interrupt canon like he dies at the end or they ended up sending him in the past and he's cloud's dad now or some stuff like he, they could do that um uh but um you know when if they do something like that then they risk the paltry payoff problem where you know the entirety of that plot thread was just to i don't know upset us about the possibility of him being alive ever mm-hmm. that's not a good that's not a satisfying payoff we've talked about that ad nauseum um but what they actually end up doing with that like they've given themselves many options and uh, i'm leaning towards it being significant and not a red herring i think i think any possibility of Aerith being alive in any significant capacity uh, is red herring at best. I think the idea of Zach is not. And I have I have a couple of uh, concerns about that. And that is that what this has sort of done is turned Aerith into a fridge a little bit. Um, I think somehow... Aerith has always a fridge, by the way, is a um, it's a it's a trope where a female character is used specifically as a stepping stone for male character progression. Mm -hmm. Um, Like that is the sole purpose that they die um, or killed is so that the male character can like, oh, I grew up. I finally see things. Aerith has always beat those allegations by being kind of like not technically connected enough to Cloud's. Uh, development you know like she doesn't show up in the live stream sequence like the part of the reason people resonate so much with the way that she dies is because it's so sudden and it and it is does have a feeling of meaninglessness like the only meaningfulness of of it is the fact that it you know um it, it, it emulates kind of the real life feeling of loss like it didn't serve a purpose mm. other than you know, like it, it's their life was more than just a purpose in somebody else's story. Like it kind of did that if but it, the way that they're doing this now is it does sort of mean that like Aerith is doing this on purpose. This is all part of a of a stepping stone for both Cloud and Zack now, you know, like so I there's there is the risk of doing that. But at the same time, um, you know, if Zack somehow ends up in the same fate. And the link to Advent Children is literally that it leads to Advent Children, which, by the way, no dev has ever said. No dev has ever said that the events of Final Fantasy VII Rebirth and the Retrilogy lead mm-hmm. to Advent Children. They Links always use with. very specific linked <laughs> or add up to. Never yeah. <laughs> has there been an explicit statement saying that mm-hmm. Advent Children is the sequel to the retrilogy. They always say that they link and that they add up to. And those are still very possible outcomes with, you know, the quote unquote sequel interpretation or like the fact that we've seen millions of links, you know, right. to those those. Right. Uh, and I, I think uh, now that even even like without the equal interpretation i already see like the thematic links to yeah. advent children that are really coming out and especially in like the last few chapters yeah of rebirth and i'm starting to see i'm like oh okay whether they literally connect this to advent children or not in terms of like oh chronologically this follows advent or advent children follows this 
yeah. uh, is almost irrelevant for me at this point because I see now that thematically there's so much connection there that whether they literally connect it or, or not is more of like for the, the fan service and the shock value than so much as like the themes that they've already drawn connection to with Advent Children is really kind of the meat to me. That's like the actual core of um, what they're intending to do and kind of like the purpose there. So, um, so yeah, with uh, Zach's utilization, um, it does feel like they, they did like pull back a little bit there because obviously his narrative purpose is to kind of explore the other worlds in a way that leaves out the other cast so that mm -hmm. we can kind of like go through those worlds and maybe kind of see them for what they are. I don't know if that really makes sense to say, but I feel like without having the other party there, you really have you concerned about the ideas of like multiple Tifas or clouds. Um, but to really focus on the idea that there are other worlds out there and diverging paths and kind of lead us through that. Um, but in terms of like the culmination of Zack's character, it did kind of feel like he ultimately was there aside from that or just to kind of show up for the final battle and have that fan service -y moment where they're like, you know, protect your honor. They're, so <laughs> yeah, they're blowing out. Yeah, yeah like they're blowing out. I did not care for that. Yeah, I didn't I didn't really care for that either. I, uh, I like the fight. I liked all three of the fights, but the actual them like synchronizing their their buster swords. No, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, that was that was a bit much. Um, I think we were like this close to getting that live stream Buster Sword yeah. where they where they like double Omni Slash Sephiroth. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure that's that's how part three, <laughs> like the final attack that ends Sephiroth. I'm so I so staunchly believe now that that is how part three, like how they're going to defeat Sephiroth. Um, but like, what do you think? Zack's arc is going to be in the next game. I'm pretty set on he's going to try to find a way to reunite the world, and that's going to be kind of his journey. I'm hoping for a little bit more of the Zack segments in the next game, because I feel like the Zack segments in this game, they were interesting, but they were so short that you didn't really get to get that much out of them. Uh, not in the way that I was hoping. Yeah, it's it's strange. I uh, on first playthrough, I really I I I really liked the very first Zach segment, like the prologue segment, because mm. um, oh, we're gonna get to fight a Zach more, you know. Um, and then I, and then it's not till like chapter eight that you you like do a Zack segment again and you're like, oh, yeah, Zack. Well, I've already conquered three continents, you know, like it's especially <laughs> if you're a completionist, that's a long ass time. Um, and then you're like, oh, these are going to be really small, like very skippable feeling interludes, you know, and um, and so I, I was I was more disappointed the first playthrough with them. The second playthrough, I was like, you know what, like some of these have like really interesting, like point of view stuff like there's um like in uh like in the first gold saucer day when you go to sleep and the and and you wake up and like you're see like the first shot is like you're looking through cloud's eyes as and with this fixed camera angle as zach's wandering around and being like tender to Aerith and uh and that's like that was really interesting like mm. kind of from a compositional standpoint and it's like if they do this again you know I want them to really lean into that like just mm. like be as experimental as possible in like scene composition and stuff like that um uh and then like uh you don't really get to fight as his full kit until the end battle and so you don't know what it's like until you do post game stuff and then there's a post game mission with Zach spoilers um that's like one of the hardest things in the game um because you're spending the entire time ironically trying to keep Zach alive because in order to even do the challenge like competently 
Uh, Cloud is so OP, and you have the best materia and stuff that you're just like trying to keep Zach with his like super basic kit, like from dying the whole time. Um, but you get a kind of idea that like they built this full move set for Zach. Like he's got, he doesn't just have like abilities. Like his abilities have tier systems, and he's got a complex combo system. Like. He's actually kind of more built up as a character than Sephiroth was. Um, Sephiroth is pretty built up, and he, there's also a VR challenge with him that's identical to Zach's, except for that it's easy because Sephiroth is a goat. Um, and, <laughs> uh, and, and you can see that comparatively, there's more to Zach's combat. So I think that is an indication of either that they have plans for that kid in the future uh, or that they plan to use him more in this or both. Mm. Um, and, you know, the argument for the future is that uh, despite you like big quality of life changes, there were virtually no abilities in. in uh, actually, there were no abilities in remake that didn't make their way to rebirth weapon abilities, etc. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is, it is important to be foundational if he's going to be in part three in, in any way, shape or form to, you know, like have a foundation to build his character hit from a gameplay perspective. Um, uh, but I did feel like, man, I wish we would have had more like mandatory combat segments with Zach. Mm. You know, that was a big complaint I had of it. Right, because you kind of feel in that final boss fight, especially, you're just kind of shoved Zach like really quickly at the end where you don't have any time for, prior to that to really experiment with this kid or anything. And so <laughs> it feels like basically a brand new character is introduced gameplay wise in the final fight. And uh, I wasn't like a terribly huge fan of that from uh, like a game design perspective because you basically like during the final boss fight or learning how to use like another character um this also before we move on from zach i just want to ask one last thing what are the consequences of zach remembering uh, or cloud remembering zach earlier than previously right because it's it's really interesting that first of all we had crisis core reunion come out before this game and mm -hmm. the developer is encouraging people to play Crisis Core Reunion. Of course, if you do, you spoil kind of the biggest twist of Final Fantasy VII, which a lot of people think that, oh, that's Aerith's death. They're not aware of the real big twist in Final Fantasy VII, right? And now that's kind of not only out there, again, with Crisis Core Reunion, it's also that they're playing up on that, that they're saying, well, yeah, Cloud also remember Zach ahead of time. Yeah. Where do you think yeah. that's leading for, for Cloud's arc? Well, I, and I think that's why all of this is happening. I, it's, is This is Cloud's arc. Like, that's... Yeah. Cloud is the main character, and this is a game that's very, very much about its main character. And... Mm. Um, or at least FF7 was intended to be that way. That isn't necessarily how it's remembered. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of people will consider, you know, the Aerith's death to be a more iconic scene than the live stream scene. I, I get that. I get that. And there is a responsibility, you know, like you can't ignore the fact that how something is received is um, ultimately what it becomes, you know, like it, it, instead of what the devs intended but it does feel like the devs are intending still to make that the core of the story is cloud's identity stuff and that maybe because the surprise has been blown for a long time or maybe because they think that the fact it isn't necessarily the most remembered scene but it was their most favorite and important one from the story means that they need to up their game with it. And so mm -hmm. I think that they have put themselves in a position where they've forced themselves to restructure that 
Um, Cloud still doesn't really know the true Nibelheim order of events. He doesn't know that he's not a soldier yet. Um, so that element of the of 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 his identity is still going to be really, you know, critical. But he also doesn't know Aerith died. He also yeah. doesn't know that Aerith was killed because he failed to stop Sephiroth. Mm -hmm. uh, he also doesn't know that, you know, he holds a ton of responsibility for the current fate issue with the world, you know, and mm -hmm. um, and I, I mean responsibility, but not necessarily culpability. He doesn't he doesn't have all of that nuance figured out yet. And he's still 16 years old mentally and emotionally. Right. So we've got this kid that's got now a new set of like a new set of falsehoods that he truly believes some that maybe he's actively responsible for suppressing, you know, um, and uh, and the old set of falsehoods. Like he's not really a soldier. He's uh, the things that happened in Ibelheim were, uh, you know, were very different, um, mm. you know, and uh, the truth about Tifa, you know, all of that stuff. Like he still has to go through this experience where he learns all of that stuff. And, you know, just to be totally honest, it feels like maybe, and this is a big fear and we get to it into a, in a later question, I'm sure, but I'm wondering how maybe Cloud's dad enters into this, <laughs> right? I think ultimately what this is all about is that they're making the... the the big revelation at the end of the live stream sequence about who cloud really is like his true personality is there amplifying the member the amount of cast members involved in that mm. and the amount of relationships necessary to make that moment pay off you know right. like they are really doing things to make cloud and barrett's relationship more interesting like actually cloud's relationship with every single character is really been the focus of this game mm, it's like 100%. you there's an there's an affinity system where you max out your relationship with every play playable character you're not maxing out the relationship between Aerith and tifa you're it's Aerith and cloud tifa and cloud red 13 and cloud barrett and cloud there's no relational calendar counter for for sid and and vincent and kate sith yet but that's next one right so like all of these are about this is how cloud is with all of these people so you best believe that the big you know this is who i really am moment you know is is going to include and hopefully pay off all of those relationships right you know um and I know that that uh, that can be a little cheesy, and there's uh, there's shonen that does that really well, and shonen that does that really bad. Um, mm. Where it gets really hard is when seinen does it, and this is more seinen. It is. You know? It is. Um, I think it's a really common trope to use the power of friendship, but at the same time, too, as people can use the power of friendship in a derogatory way. I have, in my life experiences, found nothing to genuinely be more powerful than the bonds that you have with your friends and family around you. And I sure. think that the only reason it gets a bad rap is kind of because we've had a lot of media, and not to single out any media, that, okay. that tries to jump immediately to the power of friendship without it feeling as earned. Um, but I think that whenever you genuinely portray a character's connections with other people mm -hmm. and how powerful those connections can be with getting you through um, some of the <laughs> most insane adversity you've ever faced in your life. Yeah. Um, I think that it is 
uh, one of the most powerful themes that you can portray. Um, and it's the, one of the most Final Fantasy things. Yeah, it's one of the most Final Fantasy things. And so I, I think yeah. that the goal of Final Fantasy really is always to kind of portray like the bonds that we share right. with one another and to create something that feels genuine and authentic yeah. to that idea and will actually remain will actually make you reflect on your own bonds with people that you have in your life yeah but yeah it, it it always gets a bad rap because there are so many there's so much media out there a lot of shonen a lot of jrpgs that simply want to <laughs> go directly to we're friends and that gets us through anything and i think yeah. one of the strengths of final fantasy 7 and one of the things that they really expanded upon in this game was actually showing the relationships and giving them that kind of life that makes them believable and does make you actually, you know, kind of recall some of your closest friendships. I think that's also like the success of like 15 as well. Yeah. Was that yeah. was that for all the writing flaws that that game has and we could go on and on all day about how flawed a lot of that game's writing was but it actually did nail the core the theme. bro out yeah, yeah. Of, the, of the bros and the friendship and the actual connection between those people and it really succeeded so i think that if they can actually you know do what you're saying and bring all those characters together and all those relationships that cloud has you know into the live stream moment and, and culminated in a in a bigger um more meaningful uh way that kind of spans your entire journey throughout the retrilogy because you know there's an another aspect of this too that you're also spending more time with these characters and so you know the, the player's relationship to these characters is also been expanded a lot too so then the player also has uh, a deeper relationship with with tifa and Aerith and yeah 13 and all these characters so I think I think what you're saying there is is really spot on and, and, and beautiful because and I think if they execute on it right, uh, it can make for a moment that mm -hmm. is um, a lot more powerful um, than even what the original offered there, which I still think right. that was one of the most powerful moments, if not the most powerful moment uh, in gaming. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I and and you, what you said in the beginning was was really, really critical is that where it often fails is that it doesn't earn the moment. And that is still my fear with the project because I can give you a specific example of where a power of friendship line did not earn itself. Mm. And that is Cloud's final line to Sephiroth and Advent Children was, you know, there's nothing I don't care about. Right. Which was super cheesy at the time with the context of Final Fantasy seven. It made sense mechanically like that is the core difference between Sephiroth and and Cloud is that the the response to trauma and being an orphan is is one caring about others and one not like that is the mm -hmm. core dichotomy of that mm -hmm. of that struggle. But the the movie on its own narrative had done nothing to really earn that line landing and it had ended mm. up being super cheese ball and mm. now also we're talking about these relationships and within remake and rebirth these relationships have been really really well developed with every character mm -hmm. but there's one character who's critical to all this that really no relationship has been built with yet because the relationship is pr not predicated on something from remake it's predicated on something from Crisis Core, and that's Zack. Cloud mm. and Zack's relationship is still not plausible within the confines of the remake project. Like, it doesn't mm. make sense that they're friends. And in the OG, like, even in the international version, when they show the, you know, the, the, the final sequence, like, the, the, the depiction of that is really it's really based on how we fill in the the gaps of very, very stark negative space storytelling. Mm. 
right? Like mm. very little is told to us about Zach. Like a lot of people are really surprised that Zach had the personality he did in Crisis Core, despite that always being the, uh, you know, the the intention of his character, right? Like, and if you pay enough attention, he is the same happy-go-lucky character, like the squats, all that stuff. Like when we learn right. which parts of 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 Zach are or which parts of the Nibelheim flashback with Cloud are actually Zach's personality in the OG. We see, oh yeah, he's this happy, happy-go-lucky, uh, you know, uh, himbo that, you know, Titus was <laughs> factually based off of. Like, you know, we see the elements of that. And, um, and you know, and Zach is Nojima's character. Like, a lot of people have, have tried to say that Nojima, like, came in last minute. He was only a line, line editor. Like, his his input on what Zack's character should be is is irrelevant. That's false. He created the plot device. He created the character. Um, and, you know, if you want, Odie, my friend at Shinra Arch, can show you all of the line notes he had for each character. Zack was always supposed to be the character that he showed up to be in Crisis Core. But from the OG, you did not really get an idea that they were friends. You saw that Zack was friendly to Cloud, but you never got this idea that, like, Zack, you know, was this, you know, was this close, like, super bro energy. And Crisis Core was so weirdly edited that you get a few scenes that sort of indicate that that has happened, but you don't actually see a ton of their chemistry whatsoever. So they, in my mind, have still not earned a good relationship between mm. Zack and Cloud. And right. so for me, for Zach to pay off as an addition to the live stream sequence or the clouds mind sequence, that that friendship needs to be earned like that right. needs to be expressed in a way that's consistent with the remake project. And mm. my problem is, is how do you do that if he's dead? Right. I think that they almost need like an entire chapter, maybe two in the next game, purely focused on the relationship of Cloud and Zack to really make that kind of pay off for me. Because imagine you didn't play Crisis Core and you kind of did what Square Enix was saying, start with Rebirth, right? If you start with Rebirth, yeah, man, I feel like you are not gonna have the context at all to like really understand Zach's presence there. Like, I feel like it yeah. isn't, it is just not going to work like at all. And you have to play specifically Crisis Core, not even just OG. Cause even if you play OG and then you go to Retrilogy, you still really don't quite get Zach there. Yeah. Um, if you're, What's if you're, the big deal? yeah. Yeah. Like, like what yeah. is like truly the big, you, you may like kind of like on some intellectual level understand Zach's placement there. But you won't, sure. like, intuitively get the significance of Zack and uh, yeah. the relationship with Cloud, because it's not there. So I would say that, like, in the third game, they need a chapter or two that's just relationship building between him and Cloud. That would be... And, I mean, it, it kind of gives people the kind of fan service that they'd want. I'm sure that there's many people that would love to see... Um, Cloud and Zach just interacting and uh, catching up with each other. There was a there was a bit of moment uh, where we kind of got like a small taste of that before the battle, but then you know after the battle starts, it kind of just goes into full hype mode, and we're not really able to to do that. Um, you probably know more about this than me, but I believe that there were supposed to be more scenes depicting Cloud and Zach's friendship within Crisis Core that had to be yeah. cut due to. The UMD storage limitations, which I find that to be like, that's such a tragedy to me because that's yeah. that's the most interesting thing about the game. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, to me, you could have cut like anything else and I would have been OK. But like the one thing that I was like more interested in than anything um, was the actual depiction of Cloud and Zack's friendship, which I feel like has leaned a lot on fan interpretation more so than like um actually what's there because i don't think that there is like a tremendous amount there um 
that really depicts what I think Rebirth wanted me to believe about their relationship, if that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. Not compared to like, say like Cloud's relationship to Tifa or Aerith or Barret um, and those other characters or, or Sephiroth even, uh, where I see just significantly more um, on screen relationship with them forming. And so, yeah, I need to see more of, of Cloud and Zack and more of their friendship because currently for me, even, even with Crisis Core, I still did not feel like there was enough. And I, when I first beat Crisis Core back in the day on PSP, you know, the first thing I felt was like, man, I really wish there was more scenes where Cloud and Zack were just growing out. Yeah. <laughs> like that's like, yeah. that's really kind of the thing that I was, I was kind of wanting from that game. Uh, and it felt like it didn't really deliver that. So with Zack alive now in whatever capacity uh, you guys choose to believe, <laughs> I think now is a very good uh, time and opportunity to really expand on that because I do feel like the scene with him in Rebirth as it currently stands was like really unearned. Like I know I was supposed to be hyped for like, you know, when they were doing the embrace your dream thing, but I was just like, <laughs> this kind of just feels like they just want to, to shove like the, the fan service of CC without actually building anything up that that paid off in a tremendous enough way um to really feel authentic yeah. yeah and yeah and i mean i don't i mean in my in my just personal opinion the the line could have there could have been 14 chapters dedicated to their friendship and i still wouldn't have wanted that line but i i do agree <laughs> like there's there's um that does need to be earned and yeah. also like the mechanics of his have, of Genova's memory stuff like the memetics and all that like why does he know the line it's it's very murky um i there's obvious potential lore explanations but um yeah i don't know i um i agree though i think that um just like with remake the thing that fills the entire fandom with the most uncertainty to me is still Zack. Like, mm. because look, if if Aerith survives somehow, it'll be because of Zack, right? And um, I don't think there's a, a chance in hell that Aerith makes it out unless, like, I don't know, uh, some bizarre world shifting event happens you know and you know some celebrity that looks just like Aerith is murdered and we have collective trauma about it and decide that we can't handle that as a species like that is the <laughs> only thing that i could think of that would make that the most preferred outcome i know people do prefer that outcome and i'm not saying that they're wrong or they don't they're not entitled to feel that way they are and i i also understand that like you know when you set up a narrative mystery on something sacred and say hey we're gonna break the sacred and you're like well what could the payoff possibly be i understand that a lot of people the only thing that would be worth it for them is reviving their favorite character i get that um, it's, I, I think there are other ways to make it pay off. And I think that they're leaning more towards that, but I get it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I want death to count. So that's kind of my vote on it. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, now I want to talk about my favorite part of the whole ending. And that is Glenifer. Now, <laughs> Now, when Glenifer shows up, there's a whole lot of, uh, uh, how should I say this? Um, I didn't, I didn't really care for, for Glenn, if I'm honest. <laughs> I didn't care for his opinion here, uh, his appearance here. Um, it, it, it kind of, it actually started off kind of curious for me. 
But then as Glenn like went along, I was kind of like, man, this is this is where is this going? And then like by the end, by the ending scene, I was like, this is kind of bad, actually. <laughs> um, but there's one thing I couldn't help but notice about Glenn. Glenn looks. <laughs> no. <laughs> Come back here, sir. Come back here. <laughs> Glenn in the face. You look at Glenn. I could not help but notice Glenn's face. His facial structure, his facial features look incredibly similar to Barrett. Not just play to Cloud. <laughs> <laughs> to Cloud. I'm glad you said uh, that. Um, <laughs> He looks a lot like Cloud, and now that his hair is growing out, it looks like his hair is almost like shaping like clouds as mm -hmm. it grows out. Yeah. This has led a lot of people to think that Glenn could possibly be Cloud's cousin. <laughs> no, it's his father. People think that Glenn could be Cloud's father. And... I kind of don't see it not happening because I feel like just making his hair as it grows out look more like clouds. It was the first thing that everyone joked about when he was right. revealed in the first right. soldier. Everyone was oh, like, ha, 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 oh, blonde, that oh, blonde guy. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, and at first everyone's like, OK, first of all, not all blonde people are related. Guys, come on right. now. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. now that I'm seeing his hair, how he looks in the, like his older self and like the way like a lot of his facial features look like clouds. There's also this line at the end that he says yep. um, about the father and the son. And you could read that as just him talking about Rufus and President Shinra. But I read that as like almost like a three way line, like about Rufus and President Shinra, about Hojo and Sephiroth. And about Glenn and Cloud. Uh huh. So, um, do you think that Glenn should get a paternity test? Cloud <laughs> <laughs> is my question. <laughs> so, um, okay. They. This is another one of those things that I swear to you. They are. Creating enough of a connection that they could go the direction if if they want to. Like, so it's more than just this, right? It's more than more than just Glenn saying the daddy line, being a blonde soldier. There is also some characteristics of him in Ever Crisis. One, first of all, like we get it, like you're trying to make this a you're trying to make it so that Ever Crisis survives as an IP. It's marketing, it's the way that things work. There is a there are times when companion media is very entertaining to me. I wish it weren't a soulless gotcha. <laughs> but like like I you know I I loved Edge Runners and Cyberpunk and I love that they patched Cyberpunk to have Edge Runners stuff. Like that's an appropriate use. I'm not saying that can never work. A gotcha uh, Ever Crisis is not the worst gotcha in the world and it does have some like uh competent writing in it. And um I still play it. I still love it. Uh I'm not a fan of that being the reason this is here. There are things about Glenn's character in Ever Crisis that are starting to now line up with descriptions of Cloud's dad. So, as a lead up to Rebirth, there was a world preview book in Japan. And much like Remake, the world preview book has a short story written by Nojima. The first the remake's uh, short story was about Aerith. It was picturing the past. This is about Cloud. And there are descriptions in this short story 
about Cloud's dad, and they indicate that he is very bad with money, and that he's never seen two thousand gil. Two thousand gil is the um, uh, is a is a line that Cloud regularly uses. You know, like it's the rate that he should charged as a, you know, as a mercenary, and then it's it, it comes up a lot in Rebirth as like a running joke between, um, Barrett and Cloud, and then at one point, uh, uh, Aerith throws, uh, Cloud under the bus for visiting a handmaiden. Uh, but anyways, so uh, in Ever Crisis, we do get an indication that Glenn has gambling debts and he's always broke so that's not good right um there's all the stuff that you mentioned in the end of 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 rebirth that sort of indicate okay they're making a big big deal about fathers and sons here it could just be stuff to do with rufus and 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 his dad president shinra but it feels like so deliberate that it's got like this kind of like double meaning stuff. There is the longer hair, you know, like that is that is a thing they could do. There are plausibility issues that would sort of make it border on retcon if they decide to go this way. In Ever Crisis, at one point, the team is transported to Nibelheim. And Glenn says, I've never been here before. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this is at a point when chronologically Glenn is older or he's too old to have, uh, to have this be before cloud is born. Cloud is like three or four at this point. Um, mm -hmm. or he's actually older, I think like five or six. Um, so Glenn having gone to Nibelheim saying and saying I've never been here before indicates that either he's never been there before or that he lost his memory somehow which because he would have had to have been like 19 gone to Nibelheim put a baby in Claudia pretended to die and then left and joined soldier which does not match his characterization at all. Like he, he's kind of a dick, but he's like really paternal with Sephiroth. So like mm -hmm. they're going to have to force feed a memory loss mechanic in there. Like he lost his memory somehow, um, you know, before he joined soldier, but just for the two year period of time that he put a baby in somebody, you know? Uh, the other thing is that like there is a, a lot of people lose issue. their memories uh, between those times. <laughs> Not, impossible. Not impossible. It's not impossible. <laughs> um, it it is also like it's 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 not something that I want. You know, I'll be honest about that. Mm. Um, to me, though, in terms of Glenn, just to talk about Glenn is like a character addition, right? So it seems like when Glenn first appears as the hooded figure in Chapter 4, I'm like, let's go. Like, it, like I was surprised at how mm. like dark his voice acting was. I was like, man, I kind of like Punished Glenn. This is cool. Like, yeah. he's such a dork in Ever Crisis, you know? Mm -hmm. Um um, but he's also like kind of lovable. Like he never lets Sephiroth go. Like he's like Sephiroth's kind of a dick to him. And but he's like, no, buddy, you just need a hug. Like he at one point, like Sephiroth's like trying to find this picture of his mother that he lost, which is a, a picture of Lucrezia. But it says Genova on it because Hojo's a dick. And so he's like <laughs> really panicking about losing a picture of his mother and like Glenn gives him this big hug and it's this big bro moment. Um, and so then all of a sudden we see this Glenn show up in Junon and he's like an asshole. There's like this, this like super spoilery, like flash of, of Rufus shooting Glenn in the back. And you're like, well, I guess that's the ever crisis plot spoiled, you know? Um, and that's frustrating, but at least like, okay, we're going to see some weird stuff happen with this character. 
but never did I imagine that like it would go the way that it did. Um, hmm. Him being like the like this other leader of the Shinra Resistance Corporation that makes sense because like they do need plot beats for part three and they did they have been for years setting up this republic of junon subplot like that there was this previous governmental force which is like a republic a, a democracy basically that was toppled by shinra like aggressively like through war and um and shinra became the dominant power and so like it goes into the geopolitics of Shinra rising to power and the rebellion now has like all of these forks that are going to be a lot more like instead of it just being like this lone group of like kind of insane terrorists. Um, it's like this whole structure of people that are just like down with Shinra. And so it does seem like part three, what they're doing is they're they're setting up a big like rebels versus empire fight you know that that we're going to be part of and what that'll help us do is like elevate the importance of Wu Tai in the plot and make that less of a like a optional thing but instead more of like an exploration of that you know culture an exploration of what you know um what rebellion looks like and what the difference between like you know uh like insular cells of rebellion and then big organize movements like it's an opportunity for us to explore all of that and mm. i'm okay with that like that's mm. you need that kind of stuff like and in fact if there's anything that i feel is kind of missing from rebirth is it's like real political messaging like i know mm. not every game needs that but final fantasy 7 had that very strong and like i kind of think that like that that was one of those things that resonated with me you know, mm, I really 100%. like the political messaging. I would mm. like them to like not distance themselves from that. Hopefully they don't screw it up, you know. <laughs> um, so Glenn's involvement in that, along with um, uh, Matt and Lucia are confirmed to be alive as well. I'm not sure if you knew that. No, oh, no, I didn't know that. So in the Proto Relic quests in Cosmo Canyon, we find out that Matt and Lucia are generals in in the Wu Tai uh, army, basically the Avalanche HQ branch. Oh, okay. Um, so we we learned that there's like this burgeoning power structure of 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 like this Wu Tai center that uses these characters from Ever Crisis. I'm way down for that. Right. Like I'm way super down for that. Mm. Um, yeah. What? I'm not sure about is uh, the very last scene where one, uh, yeah. <laughs> one, the localization really like, like the localization doesn't, doesn't make it very, like, doesn't make it uh, as absurdly clear that Viceroy Saruf is actually Rufus, but the, but the Japanese translation, like, it's like a direct anagram for Rufus. So Rufus is literally Rufus. Ah, uh, yeah. The letter, letters. But you still, like, as an English player, like, no, that's what's going on. And that is a before crisis plot beat. So that's mm. fine. However, so that's revealed. And then Glenn does this thing that's so crazy and reveals himself to not be Glenn, but instead Sephiroth. And I I don't see the value of that yet. Yeah. Um, I I think I think there's precedent for Glenn choosing Glenn as a host because it seems like Glenn and Sephiroth, although they have an adversarial relationship at the beginning of Ever Crisis, there's this fight that breaks out between Glenn and um and Sephiroth. Uh where in it right beforehand by the way sephiroth is almost crying as an adult trying to get a hold of genesis on the phone which is like <laughs> weird characterization but i'm hoping they explore that more um and then like that is interrupted by glenn popping out and just picking a fight 
with Sephiroth. We then find out that Rufus probably kills Glenn. So I get the sense that Sephiroth is using Glenn as a as a host to mock Rufus because he in fact resents Rufus for killing one of his few friends in the world. Mm -hmm. But the messaging of that is also, also super sadistic because if, like, for instance, Glenn is Cloud's dad, yeah. then Sephiroth not only killed, like, his baby mama in Nibelheim, but has spent, like, sort of a time loop of eternities trying to both um, uh, kill and probably marry his son which is weird you know right I mean, what are you gonna do yeah that's, that's weird <laughs> yeah yeah that's one of those connections it's like uh you know when we talk about like bad bad tie-ins and lazy tie-ins like the there's that famous george lucas quote about poetry uh where he's talking about how like every main character is for some reason from dagobah and like some of it's like super forced and it feels like, okay, you're just trying to, you just like, you're losing creativity. So you're just redoing the same thing. And his justification for that was like, it's poetry. It rhymes, you know, like, <laughs> so doing stuff like that yeah. is rhyming. Like when you're just making like these connections that feel like they're really just trying to recapture the same plot beats over and over again that's kind of lazy and comes across as rough mm. the connections that glenn would then have to somehow like retroactively feed itself into uh mm. cloud's life as his father especially with the relationship with sephiroth that feels rough that feels really like mm. not effective whereas so many of the other compilation additions in the remake project in particular feel like more reverberations more like this is a love letter to itself where mm. maybe they don't always take themselves seriously but like this is this is reverence to the source material like all these connections are a way to make the story feel more real and alive whereas some of these connections like you know crisis core zach falling into the church or before crisis the player Turk falling into the church and running into Aerith, like everybody falling into the church. That feels more like a parody right. of Final Fantasy VII, whereas some of the other inclusions and connections that I think are really effective, you know, uh, feel like a love letter. And so it's, finding that line is really tough. And I don't see a path where Glenn being Cloud's dad isn't a parody, yeah. you know, like... Uh, but I could be wrong. I would love to be proven wrong. I would love for him, first and foremost, to not be Cloud's dad. But, you know, I would take being proven wrong about that being a good thing. My, my, you know, I hope that we never learn who, who Cloud's dad is. If, I, if we're same. up to me, <laughs> you know, let's leave it a mystery. Yeah. You know? I'm Cloud's dad. I would prefer that. <laughs> Like, dude already has a mom named Claudia that's yeah. blonde. Yeah. Her, the dad could be anybody. Like, uh, especially basically me. any white guy, you know? Yeah. And we're pretty much good, you know? <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. So this is going to be like my final question uh, for you. However, chat. I want you guys to go ahead and put your questions in right now. Highlight them so that it's easier for me to find or tag either one of us in it. So that when I'm scrolling through, I can pick your question apart just from conversations that other people are having about other stuff. So um, I want to know what most excites you going forward and what least excites you. So what are you most excited about and most concerned about going forward? I actually want to hear your answer first. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. What I think is is most interesting to me out of everything the, the ending kind of introduced 
who was the black materia that was in Cloud's pocket. And it was also incredibly eerie to me, like when he slots it into the Buster Sword, it doesn't slot in like a normal materia. It like it dissolves into the sword and then the sword does like this weird, like really creepy effect. Like it just resonates with like the sword. And so I'm really curious what the function of the black materia that Cloud has is going to be. Right? Yeah, like someone in the chat says it was like the, the Venom symbiote. Yeah, that's 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 exactly what it was like. It was very, it was very, very disturbing in a way. <laughs> and so I'm really curious on where that's going to go and what that's going to do. Because I don't think we've ever seen like a black the black material being used in a weapon like that. And that is going to be very interesting. I'm, I'm wondering if that is because I think the most dry thing they could do with it was is that he's just holding on to it for Sephiroth. Like if that's just the narrative function uh, function of it all, that it's just a clever way of him to like deliver it to Sephiroth without anyone knowing, then I'm kind of like, eh, that's whatever. Uh, so I want it to be something more and I want them to do something more with it in terms of like my greatest concern going forward my greatest concern is that there are maybe too many threads going on and they have a lot to resolve in the third game so much so that i think they have to hit the ground running pretty fast <laughs> in the third game because there are so many ongoing threads that i'm like how is this all going to resolve in one more game there is the situation with the multiverse, there's Zack, there's Glinifer, there's uh, the Terra in the Sky. I mean, all of the Wu-Tai, um, you know, there's uh, Sid and Vincent have a lot of stuff to, to, to cover as well. There's a crap ton, the weapon fights. There's a lot of stuff to cover in part three. So part three is going to have to be one of a game for it to properly give time to every single one of those beats and tie them all up together and end things in a very conclusive uh, send off. So that's a lot of game that they have to make there. And my biggest concern is that things could potentially end up being rushed. And I don't want that to happen. Yeah. That's a fair concern. Yeah. Um, I think on the subject of too many plot threads, um, weirdly, uh, it, Like, on paper, like in terms of dialogue and stuff like that, um, there a lot of what passes time between disc two and three is the stuff that you do, ironically. Mm, yeah. And in this game, that's the same. However, this game doesn't cover disc two at all. This is just the rest of disc one. Mm -hmm. So what I feel like they they probably established here is how their world system will work. And a lot of these assets will just get straight up reused. And mm. there are a lot of assets that were straight up reused in in um, from remake to rebirth, too. There's a lot of new assets, too. But I, I almost feel like there is less new assets mm. uh, that will that we're sort of expecting from part three so like i think from a developmental standpoint um i'm not ultra concerned about like the world i am i am though like you concerned about how we wrap up these plot threads now, how I think the multiverse wraps up is I th think we saw most of it wrap up. 
Oh. I, I think... I don't think there's infinite worlds forever now. I think worlds are created inside of the planet as a result of destiny breaking. Mm -hmm. You know, as or stretching the bounds of best of, of of destiny. There are still many things that are outside of that system. One of those things, by the way, appears to be both the white and black materia. I don't think there's two copies of that materia, by the way. I don't think mm -hmm. we got the Terrierverse version of the white materia. I think the white materia that Aerith had works the same way as the black materia they got from the altar. It is a keystone for the real thing that happens in between worlds, that, that is achieved between worlds. There's actually visual language to suggest this too, by the way. There's both a white space and a black space. One that the uh, Black Whispers take, you know, some take you into and one that the White Whispers take you into. So I don't think that we're looking at like multiple copies of all the materials anymore. I think that what we're looking at is a resolution that involves just the prime continuity surviving, like an end to the quote unquote destiny breaking. Um, you know, and I think that'll all happen on a closed loop. Uh, I think we might find out that the origin of the problem is going to be some future stuff, you know, the sequel angle, so to speak. Um, I don't, st I still don't think that that's the best way to describe the project, but I do think that people that are usually talking about sequel are usually talking specifically about that mechanism that like a Sephiroth in the future or something. Um, is responsible for the deviation in Remake's plot. I think all of that, though, the point I'm making, though, is that all of that, though, will be closed by the end of Afterbirth, Part 3. Mm -hmm. um, I, and so I'm... I'm that Weirdly, one of the le things I'm least concerned about, I think it's going to be... Um, uh, more elegant and thematic of an explanation than it will be uh like clever like i don't mm. think we're gonna we're gonna be mind blown by it like i don't think we're oh that was so clever they put this ultra complex rubik's cube of concepts together and made them fit into this you know <laughs> uh this nolan-esque puzzle i don't think that's ever been the goal i think instead it's meant to serve like theme purposes it's meant to uh deliver us you know on a journey through our feelings about these characters like that's like everything multiversal in this case like what was its point it was to explore characters like really like even characters like Biggs and mm. whether it did a good job of that or not you know that's that's a different question but i think that is its thematic purpose is to like explore relationships like whose relationship was explored the best in the interlude to me it was cloud and Aerith. like mm. i think that was a beautiful relationship mm. you know that that was sort of explored through that not just in the you know their date scene and this is not shipper stuff like i think i i actually think that the way they handled shipping as a thing made me enjoy the conversation around shipping for the first time ever mm. in my life. Like, <laughs> I think they really explored these relationships in a way that was like realistic mm. for young people that really all love each other, but also like are dealing with the fact that they have feelings for each other. And like, mm. there's no, you know, I, I think like it's only uh, upsetting or toxic or like, a, you can only put down other characters in it if you view it through this like really kind of like uh i i think archaic lens mm. you know i think this is just what people do and it was an exploration of characters and i think everybody involved loves each other and i think the purpose mm. of the interlude more than to tie the plot together mechanically was to explore those relationships so how do I think the multiverse threads will close in 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 part three? The same way, like 
the themes will drive their closure more than the mechanics. Right. You know, and I think that's fine. I think if you do that good, it's fine. If you do it bad, then you're disappointed on two fronts. You know, like not only did this not make sense, but like it sucked. You know, like right. Um, you know, so I, I think what they're doing is is a good way to make you still be able to explore loss. Um, you know, and not feel like you're coming out of this like defeating death. Like this is not a mechanism. The multiverse, all of that stuff is not a mechanism for us to get new outcomes for our characters. That's not its purpose. Its purpose is to explore these characters. Its purpose is as a love letter to Final Fantasy VII. Mm. That's its primary purpose. Um, you know, so I'm not concerned about that. I am concerned, though, the most, the absolute most about both the thing I'm most excited for and the thing that I'm most worried about. Mm. The live stream sequence, Cloud's mm. Mind, mm. the climax of Final Fantasy VII. For reasons that we've kind of covered here, Zack's relationship with Cloud is not, is not in a place within the lore for his inclusion in the sequence to be a good payoff. I right. do not believe that. Uh, I think at this point, uh, him showing up and like being, you got this bro, uh, <laughs> without, without additional context, improving their relationship will mm. be a disservice to the scene. It will hurt the scene. And it's the most important scene to me. It's the most important scene. I think to make all of the stuff that we've gone through, you know, pay off. So a tremendous amount of pressure is on that scene because it's the thing that I'm most looking forward to. And so they've got to do all these things with all of these characters, all of Cloud's relationships with those characters to make that pay off. The other thing that I'm really concerned about, and I know you said one thing, mm. but you're just going to get this anyways because, you know, <laughs> you know go for it, it, please, yes. Is they are really pulling back on the importance of ecological preservation in the, in the three trilogy. Mm. And mm. so um, it's still there. It's yeah. still there. But the, the way that they are I'm I'm just fearful that they're adding a little too much. Um, Shinra didn't do anything wrong, kind of stuff yeah. to the game. Yeah, I'm a little worried that um, the by adding nuance to to the corporate interest, mm. you know, by saying oh, not all corporate stuff is bad, um, and I know there's a little bit of that nuance in like the exchange between Kate Sith. And Barrett at the end of the OG. And that's fine. I think that's fair. I am worried that somehow we are leaning into the messaging of like late stage capitalism being <laughs> bad. We're we're leaning away from that a little bit. One, mm, yeah. One by just like adding all this complexity to characters. And you have to do that because Shinra Min middle manager is great. And being a good employee, I can understand, you know, that being a, a good value thing. Mm. Uh, you know, I'm not saying that you should be a bad employee. None of that stuff. But what I am saying is like it is it is crossing out some of that messaging. So you throw that in with the fact that like one of the quote unquote icons or like like the I think the driving force like the ruling body of the anti anti shinra force is secretly sephiroth disguised as like <laughs> an unlikable character from a gotcha game does send really bizarre messaging about anti-capitalist themes <laughs> in final fantasy 7 yeah yeah so i i I'm sure people won't really think about it that way, 
you know, but I will, you know, and so to me that matters. And I know people that work at Square. I want them to keep their jobs. I want Square to succeed. I'm not like an idiot. We're in the system that we're in. I want Square to succeed. Mm. I don't want people to lose their jobs. The industry's really rough right now. But there is like poignant, sublime messaging about the topic that yeah. does get defeated when the message is muddied like this. Mm. So they are they are walking a very fine line in my opinion. And I hope they walk it well. And yeah. I am seeing these potential threats come up but yeah. i will say this potential threats that i saw come up in remake um a lot of my fe fears about that were assuaged with rebirth mm -hmm. so i'm giving them the benefit of the doubt that they can do it also hamaguchi loves the app the ever moving in terms of like somebody that really loves his creation hamaguchi has really got me like kind of sold on his personality with it yeah. you know like I just think he's the only person that should be allowed to talk about this game. <laughs> Hamaguchi for FF17 too. Like that's where I, that's where that. I'm at. That's that's where I'm at yeah. with Hamaguchi. I I think he's yeah. just like a such a good guy. And I feel like <laughs> I feel like, you know, leadership in terms of Final Fantasy as a series is almost like you know, like the United States presidential elections where every 4 years we got like a new guy and we're like we need that guy. We need that guy. Yeah. <laughs> like this guy for for the next big uh the next big FF title. So I I just think it's kinda of funny. But Hamaguchi, Hamaguchi for 17. Uh hashtag that for sure. Uh, okay, so let's go through let's go through some of you guys' questions. You keep sending questions. I'm gonna start from the top here, uh, with Shirley Melodies, who asks, How do you see them handling Eris character in part three? Will she be playable? We haven't seen her last limit break yet. Great gospel. Uh, my vote is that she is playable in some capacity, even if it's just in the VR simulator, if only because the asset in code is already there. So why not use it? Um, I fully agree. I, uh, If not VR, I mean, I still think we'll get... And I'm going to say something. And I don't want people to be triggered. There are elements of Maiden in the conceptualization of Eris' character now. Mm. Maiden Who Travels the Planet is a non-canonical book that was put. It was a story that was written. It was put on an official book, but like its canonicity is uh, it's it's kind of non-existent. But a lot of the themes and sort of mechanisms were readapted and put into live stream black and white, which is part of On the Way to a Smile. So I think that we are going to see some Aerith kind of traveling the, the, like, you know, like a much more ephemeral sort of live stream experience where we may see, you know, her as a playable asset, um, you know, hopefully to some like extreme, like, like a technically interesting degree because i i do really want to see great gospel and i was bummed we didn't see princess guard you know i would love to see those um you know in a in a way that i get to utilize it you know mm. um uh if not just for like i'd honestly be even okay if it's like a cut scene limit break you mm. know where it comes out of the blue and heals us you know right before genesis plunges his sword into you know Dax brain or whatever. <laughs> okay, we got one from L. Greggs here. Uh, Baby Seal, you said the ending was pretty much Clout being delusional about Eris death and that the timelines were for that topic. Not that important. Then, how can we explain the glitches in reality that Tifa experiences as well? Uh, she didn't experience glitches. I've watched that scene a couple yeah, of times. Yeah, I, like, I don't have, remember that either. People have tried to explain, me, explain to me that Tifa sees two versions of events. The way that scene is edited seems ultra clearly that we are seeing one, the delusional cloud version of it, where T where Aerith survives, and then we get a version from Tifa's perspective that shows what really happened. Mm. If 
for some reason, I mean, and there's some vagueness, if for some reason characters are getting flashes, though, I do think that Tifa in particular would have a fairly good excuse to have some sensitivity to what's happening with Aerith and maybe in the live stream on account of her having already been in the live stream. That was a deviation. They put her in the live stream. And one of the things that sort of represents the relationship that Tifa and Aerith now have on a meta sense is not only that silent line that, you know, that Aerith whispers to, or, or that's muted, she speaks it out loud, but it's not for our ears. You know, it not only that sequence that kind of indicates that they have a, a, a new sort of plan together, but, and that they have a new relationship. But in the live stream sequence, when you are piloting the whale through the live stream, you are attacked by black whispers and white whispers controlled by Aerith, by future Aerith, by the Aerith, you know, at the end of, of remake or at the, the by the, uh, you know, at the dream sequence in, in remake is controlling those whispers, defending Tifa. Tifa is part of Aerith's plan for cloud sanity. So if she does get any kind of flashes or anything like that, that would be a lore reason. The other reason I think that that uh, Aerith is straight up not alive, she is a live stream force ghost in the ending cinematic, is that Red has a notable response to her. You know, mm -hmm. uh, when she, she, he says, Aerith, you know, and that's something more akin to the sensitivity that like, you know, uh, a being close to the planet in the live stream would have, you know, um, she, he has some kind of fading sense plus of the characters, you know, Aerith is, and, and, and Red are pretty close. You know, she's, she's the first one that Red, uh, shows his true, uh, uh, unacceptably high voice to, and, you know, uh, that, that's all like something that kind of indicates that there's a intimacy between the two characters. So it would mm. make sense, you know, like from a ephemeral, metaphoric, thematic, non, non multiversal way that red is sensitive to Aerith, you mm. know, being there. Uh, so I, I don't think one, I don't actually interpret the scene that way Two, even if I'm wrong about it, there are in lore reasons that really signify why maybe Tifa would have a little bit of an understanding of Aerith's plan more than say the other characters. Right. The Hylian 64 asked us, what is your view on Aerith's memory loss from the whispers alluded to in the beginning of Remake? Do you think that was legit or Aerith was lying? And finally, what's your bets on the third game's title? Um, I'll just say this. My bet on the third game's title uh, would be something like <laughs> Redemption, I think would be cool. But I'm pretty sure they're going to save that for like... The Dirge of Cerberus remaster. Dirge remake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is like inevitably going to happen between this and part three. Yeah. Um, so a lot, a lot yeah. of people in chat are saying reunion. And every day on my videos, I get a I comment know. that says, I bet the third part is going to be called reunion. I've Guys. Never, I've never the, gone a day. Yeah. Guys, the third part one title that we know for sure the third part will absolutely not be called is reunion that name is already taken by crisis core reunion they already used it <laughs> yeah but every day i get a comment from someone say, every day multiple times a day i get a comment from someone saying i bet the third part's going to be called reunion crisis core reunion is already a game they're not going to reuse Reunion. They already used it once. So it's going to be called anything but Reunion. I agree, though. Reunion would have made the most sense. I think they shouldn't have used it on Christ's Core. But anyway, um, <laughs> I just wanted to get that out. Um, 
Yeah, but in terms of Aerith and the memory loss, no, I think, I think, I think that that's, I mean, I think that's what happened, right? Like, they lost uh -huh. her memories. And that's why the materia went from being an active white materia to a clear deactivated white materia is because the, the whispers take the memories, you know, materia is also essentially crystallized memory too. And so, yeah, they took that. I, and, yeah. So, um, okay. So this is an interesting one on that. Yeah. The, the, the localization sort of made it sound like the whispers paused the white materia to be empty. But in Japanese, the memory of what happened to it seems more to be the target. Oh, I think the reason the materia is empty is because she cast it on the portal. Oh. Um. To, yeah. So that's that's what I think. Uh, I think that the function of holy is that uh, it started to decorrupt Sephiroth's corruption of the 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 whispers, the corruption of the live stream. Um, regarding the memory loss, um, I feel fairly confident that that was not gaslighting. I think she did, in fact, lose her memory. Mm -hmm. In uh, I have a couple reasons to say that. One, it's like kind of uh, alluded to heavily in the in the plot of the game. Also, three devs have confirmed it in various materia, uh, material Ultimania Plus, material Ultimania, and even in the base Ultimania, which was never translated. <laughs> mm. uh, but so, um, you know, I, I do think that uh, that did happen. I don't think that that Aerith is gaslighting Tifa or Aerith about that. I think that did happen. I do think, though, that um, several times when we are talking to Aerith in this game, she has all of her memories back. And when she's speaking, and it's from a place that includes memories that she shouldn't have, it's an indicator to us that she's dead at the time that she's telling us. That she mm -hmm. is future Aerith. That she is the Aerith with memories closest to the future as the Ultimania describes her in the the scene and the resolution scene in chapter 14 of, of part one. Mm. Um, so that we never see her speak, though, in that way while she's concretely with the party. We only see that in, if, in the interlude or in um, in scenes that are dreamy, right? So like... Uh, when Aerith is talking to Cloud in the uh, forbidden in the sleepy forest, you know, uh, or in the um, uh, the misty forest, the on the way to the forgotten capital, I think that's future Aerith. Mm. I, and I think oh. you know they may even try and um, uh, allude to the possibility that in the OG scene that's true of the earth that you're talking to in that sequence. Uh... Um, I don't love that. I don't love that. I think keep the lore separate enough that we can interpret the OG however we want so that we can just say, okay, this is the way we're going to interpret the remake project. It's the way that we're going to interpret the, this. Um, right. As far as the third title, um, you know, one of the things that uh, sort of clued us into the title of part two was the soundtrack. Uh, you know, we got the one winged angel rebirth. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I, I do think that some people have indicated that because Sephiroth, like Bizarro Sephiroth is called Sephiroth reborn, that the title of part three will be reborn. Um, I I don't think so. Uh, I'm going to throw out a title 
that I think is really thematically the most interesting. And this is very much, very much a shot in the dark. And I want it to be that way. Like I'm not, I'm not really taking this from any like lore thing. This is just like my one wild gut shot with no real thing other than what I think the, what I think the plot will kind of focus on or what I wanted to focus on. And I'm going to say repent as the third part, because I think it applies to a lot right. of us. It applies to cloud for obvious reasons. It applies to Shinra and avalanche for things that they've done. Um, you know, it, uh, uh, applies for the species and the treatment of the planet. And I think even, and it may, and I'm really hoping it will apply to the Cetra and their treatment of the Gi tribe. Mm -hmm. Um, I think there is a, there is a, a subplot that they're trying to get at there. When you pick that apart, that says that hey, maybe the Cetra were not perfect. Yeah, I kind of found that interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. What what color is the logo going to be? <laughs> is it going to be purple? In my head, it's purple. Yeah, I mean, that's that's like the gradual evolution of, of Sephiroth thing, you know? <laughs> um, it's got to be purple. <laughs> um, I think I think full meteor red's a good, good good choice but i do think that like some mm. of the some of the imagery is going to be heavily and this is ultra red herring ish i think a lot of the imagery is going to be centered around Aerith and yellow flowers um mm. and not just to make us think that maybe she can um you know come back but also because uh they are thematically making her quote unquote sacrifice um you know, more important to the story. And I have mixed feelings about that because I, I do think that although loss and life do often include sacrifice as a subject mm -hmm. in a theme, I don't think that was really what worked in the OG about mm -hmm. it. Like mm -hmm. you weren't thinking, oh, she did this for us. In the end, you're like, oh, you know, here's here's Afterlife Aerith, you know, coming in clutch, uh, you know, to to defeat Meteor. That's rad. But like you weren't it, it wasn't like this big thing. And this like the final weapon ability is called Noble Sacrifice. And the final <laughs> word before she gets killed is she just like, I just all I care about is my friends. I just want them to be OK. You like like it's very like the sacrifice stuff is a lot more spelled out and mm -hmm. i do understand that a lot of these concepts do need to or there is a pressure when you have a uh you know a 500 hour experience uh you know covering a originally 40 hour story there is pressure to spell these concepts out more but some of the concepts worked really well without extra exposition mm. and i think sacrifice is one of them i agree and i also think i also think fate and destiny is one of them although i do i am starting to feel a connection to the fate destiny stuff in a way that m feels a little bit more thematically uh consistent with the og in rebirth than i did in remake mm. There was a really good one here from Liv T that was, do you guys think Rebirth's ending is too difficult for the average player to understand? Found that to be a really good question. I think that <laughs> there, there is definitely going to be a lot of debate on that. Uh, there is certainly a number of ending explained videos that have been coming out. I produced one. Uh, Baby Seal is going to be producing his own. Uh, there are some from the bigger publications like IGN, GameSpot, 
there is a very big demand for Union has a good one. Too. Yeah, Final, uh, Final Fantasy. Fantasy. Daryl, Daryl made a good one. Yeah. Yeah, Daryl made a really good one. If I um, were to recommend two, I would literally recommend yours and Daryl's. Yeah. Oh, thank you. And then mine because it's right. <laughs> um, but yeah, there, there's going to be a ton that are coming out. I'm sure that um, Maximilian dude is also probably going to be doing his own ending explain video. He's probably going to have. Uh, probably another spoiler cast, I imagine, uh, with Easy Allies, where they do their own sort of live breakdown of the ending as well. And so, I do yeah. think, I do think that um, you know, there does require uh, a bit of lore expertise to fully grasp everything that is going on. I think that I don't think that it necessarily requires the player to um you know go look up a youtuber to explain it to them but i do think it requires a lot of homework i do think that you need to play the og and experienced most of the compilation and have played both of the re-trilogy games to fully grasp the big picture i think that if you're a new player and you really enjoyed all the experience before that, <laughs> and you thought that you were able to follow everything that I do feel like, you know, I do feel um, empathetic to you in that situation because, you know, um, just talking to friends who played Remake for the first time, and that was their mm -hmm. first experience with Final Fantasy VII. Some people was their first experience with Final Fantasy. And they, you know, their basic sentiment was, is that I was following the whole thing really well, I thought. And then I got to the ending. And then there was this guy with like spiky black hair. And I really didn't know. <laughs> yeah. I didn't. Was like, and, you know, they're basically like, and then I really didn't understand that. And then I didn't really understand what exactly was happening, you know, during the final fight. So whether I think it's too difficult for the average player to understand, I think it's. I think it's well reasoned enough that the average Final Fantasy VII veteran can wrap their head around it pretty well without the need for someone, without the need of a third party to explain it to them. But I feel right. like if you're not an FF7 veteran and this is kind of like your introductory experience, I do feel like you are somewhat gatekept from the, the impact of what this is all supposed to be. And you probably will not fully grasp, you know, who Zack is even supposed to be, for example, um, unless you are knee deep into Final Fantasy VII, which I guess that has kind of been like, my my bigger criticism of like Retrilogy in general has just been like, I feel like this should have been the ultimate accessible title for anyone who wants to try final fantasy for the first time but i feel like mm. understanding a lot of these concepts requires you to dig so deep into final fantasy 7 whereas i feel like it probably should have been written more so that new players could play this trilogy in isolation and get everything they need to know and thus far i'm not really sure if entirely that's the case because there's elements like Zach and Glenn that I feel like if you don't know, then God damn, <laughs> you really uh, don't know. Yeah. 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 I, so, okay. Um, I, one thing I will say is I would rather, um, uh, like main series titles be made with the most, the highest level of, uh, lore accessibility uh mm. rather than remakes i think if there's one one sort of uh, i think the remake is, is actually a safer place to um kind of experiment um in terms of like a brand identity uh mm. i for one am very against uh like trying to make like ever cater to like an average audience level of understanding um mm. i would never want that uh i think you know the best ending in a game 
uh, in the last, uh, I know, 10 years uh, is still Alan Wake 2. And that is not an accessible game. Like, you, it, it requires work to understand, but it really it pays off for me. Like, uh, I really, really like that. I like esoteric stuff. Um, I like, you know, I, I don't ever want to feel like, you know, uh, I need to have been pandered to at the lowest common denominator. Mm. I also don't think that we're supposed to know right. uh, everything in this game. I think Mr. it's it's appropriate to end, you know, first and second parts of games that do rely on, you know, mystery. And Remake relies on mystery. It does. Like the R trilogy, that is one of the bras of it. A lot of people like that. If you don't like that, this is not going to be for you. That's fine. Um, but I do. And so I do want to be able to think, you know, about what this means for a long time. And um, I'm not going to wholly... I, I would have been... Uh, I would have been concerned if I felt like this was closed up. So I think that I still believe that like an average player, an uh, average casual player will can play through both of these titles and say, um, you know, I clearly was not supposed to understand everything that happened at the end of this, of these games. And Hopefully that's explained well enough that I could play all three of these games and know what happened. I would like all three of the remake trilogy to be enough for somebody to feel like they've had all of their mysteries satisfied. And then some of the ultra deep mysteries, you know, like really bizarre, like, uh, you know, like fan servicey stuff or like, um, Stuff that's really just for people that look at ultra deep lore and like details like that. Some of that stuff, if that has ties to Before Crisis, that it really benefits you to have known what Before Crisis was or Crisis Core Reunion or Dirge of Cerberus, that's fine. But uh, the fear is, like you said, if at the end of the re-trilogy, mm -hmm. somebody that's only consume the retrilogy feels like they don't understand what happened and they have adequately explored that material um you know that's that's when you're wondering well was this a failure in the auteur's ability to convey information you know and if i think enough media literate people like at the end of at the end of the retrilogy that are like this was adequate um then you know then you've got to look at the broader casual audience and say hey did i know what was going on throughout this entire trilogy and then if the answer is no then you're like hmm maybe maybe it's a little bit in between but if like at the end of this the unanimous vote is i would have had no idea what happened in the re-trilogy completely, not just one and two, mm. had I not played FF7, had I not played Before Crisis, had I not watched Max Dude, Sleep Easy, and Schrodinger's <laughs> Baby v Seals video, um, I, I think at that point, he, there's a failure in, in communication. You know, like, I think right. there's a, there's, that's a disingenuous thing. Um, and, um, you know, but that being said, I, I don't know of anybody that got, say, Alan Wake 2 right off the bat. Like, mm -hmm. you had to be really deep in the lore. And some people, like almost everybody, were like, I know that was mysterious. I know there are things I don't understand about that. I can't wait to go look back and figure that out and look through DLC and watch videos on it. Like, and that's a rewarding experience. Like, mm -hmm. and, and nobody's really criticizing that for being inaccessible. What they're saying is that that's the kind of experience that is. The right. problem with Remake is that that is not the type of experience the original was. And so you're changing the core identity of something to be also this mystery. And 
we're still not in a place to know if the closed informational loop of the retrilogy is adequate, you know, uh, right. to, so I agree. Also regarding ending conversations, I, um, I am waiting to release my, my video is pretty much done. I am starting to add some stuff in because I was looking at it and I was like, Oh fuck, I'm a perfectionist. But, um, I am releasing that when Max dude finishes the game, which he's kind of paced to do, I think yeah. today. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I'm, and then, I'm, I'm really excited to see him react to it. Yeah. I want to see him react to yeah. it. Also, Max has agreed to speak to to do content with me on this so uh -oh. there will be max baby seal content oh oh on it. i'm really excited for that um so. yeah because you know the the thing about max too is that like whether he intends to or not his theory and opinion on it will always shape the nature of the conversation and it's not yeah. even like he's he's not even actively choosing to do it it's no, just then yeah it's just the nature of being um such a beloved person with that yeah. much of a following uh who that many people um care about um that many people care about um his takes and how he feels about these sort of things so um in a way you know and the developers also you know they pay close attention to to how he reacts to these things as well and so yeah. it kind of becomes this situation where you know how Max feels about it <laughs> in some way probably does shape. Um, you know, it definitely shapes the discourse and it might even shape, you know, the developers when they're trying to decide on some of these finer details about what to do. So I think that his take on this is going to be uh, incredibly important. I imagine him coming out pretty positive on it. It'd be like incredibly difficult for me to imagine him seeing this and uh, reacting negatively to it. He just, I just don't see that happening. So um, it's just going to be really fascinating to yeah. see if he comes up with something or if he says something that is kind of fundamentally different than the track that a lot of people are on because. <laughs> I remember back in 2020 uh, when I first put my my kind of theories out and my kind of theory explained videos and what I thought about the ending and the moment Max kind of gave his opinion, <laughs> every comment yeah. on my videos became, I know, go watch Max, dude. He he told the truth about what and I was yeah. like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> And he's told both of us yeah. that he didn't want that. Like, he didn't yeah. want that. Yeah, he doesn't want to be weaponized, you know? Personally yeah. told us. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. so bear, bear that in mind. Um, but yeah, it's, it's like, and it's cool. Um, he's a great guy. But yeah, I, his, his opinion will be like incredibly crucial. And like, I'm, I'm going to be there in his stream watching. I'm sure most of you will be too. And, it's yeah. just going to be really awesome. And so I really cannot wait to see uh, what he has to say. It's probably, uh, <laughs> probably the, like, <laughs> like the, the most important person's take on it. And that's not even just my opinion. I think on objectively on some level. Uh, yeah, I think it's just, it's yeah. yeah. So, uh, S subtle FPS in chat said, I hope Max is an Aerith is alive believer. And <laughs> what, and, I mean to 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 level with you. I am of the opinion that he that Max's opinion on the way the 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 story is told shaped the way that Rebirth was told. I I believe that in my heart of hearts. Yeah. If I could wink at you guys, I would. Like I'm serious. Like there is a terrier in Junon. Like I, I was, I have been invited to things well beyond my follower and pay grade stuff. And then mm. all of a sudden there's a, no longer a big, like, I, I, I can't really exp explain that in a, in a clear way. But what I'm saying is that like, there is elements of these, like the, the bones of the story. I truly believe in, if you look at developer comments, they they do line up with this. There was 
uh, something specifically that Katase said actually at the Samsung thing at T Tokyo Game Show that was uh, heavily mistranslated. Um, but the, what he said was that we watched everybody's theory videos and it uh, caused us to, to have awkward moments of pause. And what people thought was that, oh, he means that the fan theories were way out there. That's not what he meant at all. If you read the, the if you read the a very, like, I think, good faith translations of the of that statement, what he was saying is that fan theories helped them create more consistency in the way that they developed the story. Because uh, something that a lot of people don't want to, I think, acknowledge, but is is something that several Japanese developers have have said publicly and that we've heard several times, Ryan and I, is mm. that the way Western audiences require coherence in their story is different than the way Japanese audiences require it. Uh, the best way that I've heard this described is by my friend Turquoise Hammer when he was explaining the multiverse mechanic of Final Fantasy XIII 2, which, by the way, written by all of the same people, as he says, <laughs> the, the, the multiverse mechanic in XIII 2 is quote-unquote vibes. And he's right. Like, <laughs> how does that work? vibes just like not vibrations i mean like just a feeling like you just roll with it it's super vibes based mechanic so yeah that's kind of the 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 way that they that they conceptualize their stories is it's like really free form not necessarily coherent doesn't need to make the same kind of sense um and so when the i think the dev team looked at all these theory videos, they felt awkward because they recognized a disconnect between their necessity for coherence and Western audiences. Let's face hmm. it, the Western audience is kind of... Uh, in, in Seven in particular, is, is kind of the one that drives the popularity of Seven. And, and sadly, because of the state of the whole union, all PS5 games at this point. Um, you know, and so... I think there is this, there's several dev comments too later that said that we have the bones of Final Fantasy 7, of 7 Part 3, you know, laid out. We have scenarios, we've been doing working on it, but we are waiting. They literally said we're waiting for fan reception to kind of finalize things. And that is, that's a, and I said that at the beginning of this podcast, that is a, fundamental truth of all anthology based media like mm. george r. r martin does it like everybody does it but it's something that very few people publicly talk about because we do not want to know how the sausage is made because there's this is we we suddenly lose confidence in the author's ability to come up with a story on their own if they are incorporating fan feedback in the very stark in your matter of fact way that the dev said it did leave give some people pause and i don't blame them like he just basically said yeah we're waiting we're waiting for the fans you know see how they respond then we'll finalize the story you know like the way he said that sounded really like oh i guess we're writing the story then i guess max do decides whether Aerith lives or not you know, like that's that's a very uncharitable way to read that, but has like a little grain of truth to it. You know, um, it sucks, but it's true. You know, I do think, though, that the non vibes based elements of the story, though, are probably in place. Right. That's that's my yeah. takeaway. Yeah. And I, I, I can't even deny and say that I'm like the the one in a thousand westerners who's like oh i don't need the coherence i'm gonna be honest i love the coherence i do uh it is it is something that i look forward to in stories and that, that i look for and um you know i guess you know even though i grew up and was kind of raised on like a lot of japanese media i i still mm -hmm. feel like i still feel like i do definitely have that western bias from from having grown up with like Western media that I do want 
I do want like my story to have like this sort of coherence and logic to it that I can look at it and feel like it has this air tightness to it where it's like, man, they thought of their concept. They worked it out in a realistic, practical way. And it feels yeah. it feels like I can see the whole <laughs> the whole cycle I, from like beginning to end. Right. I, 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 I. I'm, I I have that bias too. Like even when we talk about things that are really, really, uh, you know, sort of intentionally mysterious and what like a critic might call convoluted, but others might call genius from, I still do like things that have coherence. I mm. keep bringing up Alan Wake 2. Alan Wake 2, there is a light at the end of the tunnel for how overwhelming the lore is where you can see it all come together. And there is like really clear partitions for things that are meant to be future mysteries and things that are supposed to be things that you can natively find an answer to within the lore. Mm. And I will say that that Western Western storytelling uh, I'm not not Western storytelling. I will say that a lot of Japanese storytelling does not value that in the same way that I do. Um, and that's just the nature of it. It's not even a critique. It's just like a the true nature of our reality. So right. so that is why when I hear that the developers of Final Fantasy VII are implementing fan feedback, I'm I'm at one I'm at one point concerned, but at another point, slightly grateful, you know, <laughs> that they are meeting us where they're at, because like you and I have talked about at a certain point, this becomes the property of everyone. Right. And so Final right. Fantasy seven, when it was released, became all of ours, not just the creators. And 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 do I think that there's like a a. Uh, a market share that should be higher for, you know, the, the pie for the developers. Absolutely. I mm -hmm. do think that they should have more say in it than me, but I don't think the fans should have no say in it. And if a, if a developer is aware of the impact their product has had, and then they, or their art has had, and they look at the people whose lives the, the art has you know, touched, there is a responsibility too to say, hey, am I meeting the people who this is for where they're at? And so that's that's a charitable way to look at their fa fan input is that they're mm. attempting to reduce awkwardly incoherent things from their story. Whether mm. that pans out or not, still ultimately up to part three. You know, from a story perspective, but it, I think we can both very much agree that this, from a gameplay perspective, this thing slapped. Yeah, yeah, uh, probably my favorite Final Fantasy game of all time from a gameplay perspective. I don't think there's there's any question. It is um, what I would call to be like the future direction of the series, and that's not to say that like seventeen should be like Rebirth three. <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. but it, it, it's just to say that like, you know, the presence of mini games, um, this sort of general style of combat where you hit an enemy and build up an ATB yeah. bar, uh, you know, a big world with plenty of exploration. Those should be ideas that are incorporated into, um, the next game that they make aside from, from, you know, seven. And that's not to say that they should look like, they should look exactly like the way they are in Rebirth. It's just to say that they need to, that this is the general direction for them to yeah. shoot in. Um, and then they got it. Okay. Awesome. Right. You guys. And if you're watching on the YouTube audience, please be sure to check the description and give Schrodinger's baby still a follow. Give me a subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you all next time. Later guys. Peace. Laters.